we also wish to link territorial cohesion and urban development as well as policies that are being drafted together with all member states with the European Commission, with the European Parliament and other stakeholders. This is why today's conference is of paramount importance. The good practice examples that will be shown are quite often not seen as cases that showcase our goals but with what we are going to present today is going to show that every project contributes to the implementation of goals of European policies. At the national level, Slovenia strives for the connecting between regions with the exchange of experience and good practices together with our colleagues in other departments from the national contact point for urban development. They are communicating with our stakeholders. So every year we have been transferring the knowledge and the experience to the local levels. The experience that is exchanged within the scope of ORBACT and other programs, projects, networks in the European space. There has been transfer of experience to Slovenia as well within the scope of ORBACT together with the Association of Municipalities and Towns of Slovenia. We are organizing exchanges of experience at conference, at events where specific cases are showcased. We are organizing various information activities. We are disseminating the knowledge. We have set up a website for information of local communities. There's an entire segment of activities that contribute, in our opinion, to the raising of awareness, to the raising of, to the increased capacities for better governance of cities and towns. Without much further ado, I would close at this point. And I would extend my heartfelt welcome on behalf of our ministry, and I wish you successful work. Thank you, Asha Rogel, and now Marco Petellin, the director of the Institute of Information Science. Thank you very much for this introductory presentation. I am the director of the Institute for Spatial Policies and I'm extending my welcome on behalf of our institute. Our aim is to promote the Territorial Agenda 2030 that was adopted during the German presidency ending of last year. The implementation started during the Portuguese presidency this year and it continues during the Slovene presidency to the Council of the European Union. As Asha mentioned, the exchange of good practices is the key contributor to the implementation of the Territorial Agenda 2030. In all cases that will be shown, so each of the case refers to one of the actions within the agenda. We took some time selecting the cases, the good practice examples, and we selected them with regard to different levels of governance. We took account of territorial distribution within the European Union, whether they are implementing at the local, regional or national or European level, and 
we hope that it will be interesting for Slovenian audience. They will be interesting for Slovenian audience and beyond. Our conclusions or findings will be included in the documents referring to the Slovenian presidency. Then we will have lunch and after lunch also site visits where we will be able to show you some good practice examples in practice. So you are all welcome to join us at a site visit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. So there will be three parts to this conference. And now we are embarking on the first part. First, we are going to take a look at the topic of territorial quality of life and the role of Territorial Agenda 2030 in this area. At the end of every presentation, there will be some time for um, questions and answers. And before I give the floor to Mr. Melcian, a couple of words about him. He is um, a head of the Department for European Special Policy and Territorial Cohesion at the Federal Ministry of Internal Affairs, Construction and, and Community in, Ger in Germany. He is uh, a representative, res representative of Germany in the ESPON program. So the title of his presentation is Territorial, Territorial Agenda 2030, The Future for All Spaces. Territorial Agenda 2030 has a general goal of the future for all spaces, and this gives a new focus to the territorial cohesion as a goal of the European Union and beyond. He's going to show us the importance of this goal. Thank you. The floor is yours. Dear participants here in Maribor and at the screen. This week here physically uh, in Slovenia. Last year at this time we were still um, finalizing the draft agenda. So while it seems to me a long time ago, in fact, the territorial agenda is quite new and less than a year old. The ministers adopted the territorial agenda 2030 on the 1st of December 2020, marking more than 20 years of intergovernmental cooperation in the field of spatial development. The territorial agenda 2030 supports territorial cohesion in Europe, a goal of the European Union introduced by the Treaty of Lisbon. And with a guiding principle of a future for all places, this Territorial Agenda 2030 points to a more holistic view of the territory than in the past, and it focuses, perhaps more than before, on the objective of territorial cohesion. As a decisive element to sustain the achievements of European integration, and the future well-being of citizens in Europe. So why do we need a territorial agenda today and what can the agenda contribute? Europe faces urgent challenges. Individual and territorial imbalances have been increasing for quite some time, a topic discussed in Germany under the motto of equivalent living conditions. And on the other hand, the climate crisis and unsustainable developments call for a bold and coordinated reaction to reduce carbon emission. An aspect that itself might impact these imbalances. And also the corona pandemic has a strong differ uh, spatial differentiation, looking at the spread of the virus, the lockdown and also the recovery measures. Against this background, the Territorial Agenda 2030 emphasizes the importance of territorial approaches in responding policies in all sectors and at all levels. The territorial agenda defines six priorities grouped under two main objectives of a just Europe and a green Europe. The first priority, a balanced Europe, 
highlights the unique potential of different territories, for example, of small and medium-sized towns. The priority functional regions addresses the cooperation with surrounding and neighboring areas beyond administrative delineations. The priority integration beyond borders focuses on territorial cooperation on a cross-border, a transnational and interregional, and also a macro-regional scale as an asset, for example, via Interreg, and we will, we will hear later more about that by Philip Swartz. On the goal of a green Europe, we have the priority of healthy environment. That means protecting ecosystems and biodiversity, increasing resilience and working towards climate neutrality. We also have the goal of a circular economy, supporting place-based local and regional processes. And lastly, we have the priority of sustainable connections, promoting the digital and physical connectivity and accessibility of places. With that, all in all, the Territorial Agenda 2030 retains the overarching policy aims and concepts and priorities of the past, but adapts them where necessary to new challenges and developments. And from the beginning, a focus was on the application of the Territorial Agenda 2030 and to give a perspective on its practical implementation. When 30 states and further European institutions devise such a strategic document, abstract wordings are inevitable. But the underlying themes are not abstract, but they concern every citizen in Europe. It is about distributive justice, accessibility of services and quality of life. Where I want to live, I must have the chance to live well. It is about living and working in an appealing environment, being mobile and family friendly. So what do we need to implement the Territorial Agenda 2030? It is about raising awareness, communicating and informing. It is about providing evidence and about, in, about starting projects with actors. Having this in mind, with the adoption of the Territorial Agenda, the real work has just started. To better communicate the Territorial Agenda 2030 to all governance levels and the public, the agenda has been translated in all EU languages and a short and easy to read summary has been produced. Also, an atlas for the Territorial Agenda 2030 has been produced together with ESPON. Um, in many EU languages, it is uh, available and it visualizes the territorial development in Europe and shows under many thematic aspects, territorial priorities and challenges and provides ample evidence. In addition, a website has been set up that informs about the Territorial Agenda 2030, its aims and its implementation with additional material, how to start the pilot actions and regular news around the Territorial Agenda. All these evidence on communication measures shall support the implementation process. The Territorial Agenda needs the action of committed players and it addresses key stakeholders in a own chapter specifically. It addresses member states, the local and regional actors, as well as European institutions and bodies, and asks each in the context of its regular mandate and competencies for action. So what is a pilot action? A pilot action develops, tests and demonstrates practices that contribute to achieving the territorial agenda priorities and objectives. Pilot actions are the gears to translate the strategic objectives into practice, and they can be done on all levels and in a flexible manner, bringing together partners from different levels, sectors and spaces. Six pilots have already been launched with the adoption of the territorial agenda last year, and they already encompass a wide range of European partners from different levels. They address various relevant themes and are spread all over Europe. New pilot actions are envisaged and they are under development and everybody is encouraged to participate at the ongoing and to devise new ones. 
So you might ask yourself, why should I participate? Or what is in it for me? And there are several benefits of taking a territorial approach that have been confirmed when assessing projects in the past at different occasions and by different institutions. First, using a spatial lens is instrumental to identify the specificities of a place, be it urban, rural, in between, identifying functional links and also links that cross across borders. This territorial understanding allows to use the unique potential of each place in the best way. Secondly, territorial approaches help establishing new governance structures and cultures because the approaches are often vertical, multi-level and horizontal integrated. They avoid uncoordinated and potentially contradictory approaches because of different perceptions. And usually in territorial approaches also local authorities have a greater say. Thirdly, the integrated approach cutting across policy fields allows a more cooperative, inclusive and sophisticated responses when addressing complex challenges. And fourth and last, addressing territorial challenges in an integrated multi-level way often requires new and experimental approaches and they lead to innovative new tools, sources and solutions in the end. So where to start when you are interested? We prepared a leaflet that you can find on the website for a first information and there's also an easy to use contact form. And if you need some inspiration for your pilot activity, we also compiled over 50 examples of ongoing measures that exemplify territorial approaches in policy design and in delivery. They are listed from local to transnational and under the six priorities of the territorial agenda. You find the brochure also on the website under the overview of pilot actions. And these examples show a broad range of actions that are possible and that implement uh, priorities of the Territorial Agenda 2030 without specifically labeling it as that. So please feel inspired and inspire others. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy now that we will hear from two of the most important actors for supporting the Territorial Agenda 2030, namely Interreg and Espon. Thank you. Thank you very much to Daniel Melzian. Before I give uh, the floor to Interreg and Espon, we will, as a warm-up, bring in a tool to give both the public here live and remotely connected the opportunity to get some extra feedback about today's topic. We are using Mentimeter. It is a tool that you can access at uh, www.menti.com. On the main page, you enter the code you can see up on uh, the slide. I will read it out, but you will probably not remember it. It's 94910348. You enter this at the Menti main page and you can answer the question on the slide. First question. Which are the pressing topics to be tackled when implementing the Territorial Agenda 2030? You can enter words. I will give you a few seconds to enter your answers. Is it not working? Is it working slowly? Uh, okay. Let's take a few more seconds. Uh, 
we can now see the results. We have both Slovenian and English words. Since we have only one, they're the same size. We now have just being bigger, meaning more answers. Then we have cooperation, place-based approach, balance, sustainability. And then we have in Slovenian, use of spaces, urban transit, uh, sustainability, balanced. So just sustainability and cooperation have gotten the most answers. Where just seems to be in the center. Uh, let's finish the first question and move on to the second. Okay. Second question for all actors, no matter the governance level be it national or European, what support would you wish for with implementation of the Territorial Agenda 2030? Mm -hmm. So we see cooperation, funding, those have shown up first. So you have funding twice, cooperation, Also, we have funding quite a few times, capacity, capacity building, tailor-made evidence for local needs. Yes, this was not a, a good translation for uh, needs. Then we have tools, funding again. So we have cooperation tools and funding showing up the most. Thank you very much for uh, your cooperation. And now I'm giving the floor uh, to Ada to continue with our conference. We have a remote participant next. This is Mr. Philip Schwartz, who is working since 2013 for Interact. He is now working on the inclusion of territoriality in Interreg and maritime cooperation uh, with Interreg. Before that, he was uh, head of the Joint Technical Secretariat for Interreg 4 for the area of the Baltic Sea. He will speak about bringing territoriality to Interreg, Interreg which are uh, as projects with European territorial cooperation. But what makes a project, interact project, a truly territorial project? So to find the answer and to this and to related questions, Interact funded, founded an uh, unofficial focus group and Mr. Schwartz will uh, present their work and the first findings of said group. Mr. Schwartz, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mrs. Tsanko, for this very kind invitation. And of course, thank you very much to the Slovenian organizers for giving us Interact an opportunity to share with you what we are doing in the field of territoriality and especially the linkage between the territorial agenda 2030 and Interact. And uh, the poll just a, a minute ago is a perfect transition as uh, cooperation was one of the keywords uh, popping up several times. And of course, cooperation is also the key element of Interact. Just maybe uh, two sentences about Interact, because I'm, I'm not sure that every one of you immediately knows what Interact is about. You're all very familiar with Interact and the relation between Interact programs providing support, financial support to Interact cooperation projects. And you can say a similar support relationship exists between us and Interact and the Interact programs, because what we do is actually providing the Interact programs an opportunity to meet, to network, to exchange, to learn from each other, to exchange best practices. This just as a little background that you know from which perspective 
Uh, we are looking at it. I can assure you that both my colleague uh, Bernhard Schausberg and myself, who are working on the TA2030 and Interreg, we would have loved to be with you in Maribor, but the present situation unfortunately um, didn't allow. But we are very much looking forward to a physical meeting and get together in the future. So maybe the first question would be, why did we at all got interested in working on the relationship between Interreg and the Total Agenda 2030? And you can say the most obvious is, of course, just reading the Total Agenda, where you find um, specific mentioning of Interreg um, as one of the tools actually making the Total Agenda 2030 happen, or you can uh, maybe say, as Dr. Melzian, he used the word of application, so that Interreg can play and should play a role in the application of the Territorial Agenda 2030. Our starting point was in 2020, so about two years ago, um, let's say somewhere a bit before that, uh, we started kind of with the idea that ETC is not just ETC. I mean, Interreg or European Territorial Cooperation is not just any kind of cooperation, but it's territorial cooperation. So the starting point for any Interreg program, for any Interreg project, any cooperation project should be a given territory. A given territory which doesn't necessarily need to be the program area, but which can be smaller than the program area, which can be bigger than the program area. And for that territory, there is either a vision or a vision needs to be developed. And then a strategy which helps um, translating the vision into a practice. And for this, for then implementing the vision and the strategy, that's where the Interreg programs and the Interreg projects come into the picture. So this was the starting point uh, for us. And in 2020, um, we started under the heading of bringing territoriality into Interreg with working on the, you can say, the notion of territoriality, the notion of functional areas, the notion of functional regions. In 21, uh, so the beginning of this year, we then actually focused the work on the Territorial Agenda 2030. Uh, we uh, kicked off uh, our work with a, a broader conference uh, in March, which we actually called intentionally not Territorial Agenda 2030, but Territorial Cooperation Agenda 2030, to indicate the link between Interreg and the Territorial Agenda 2030. And that was just a, a first awareness raising um, event uh, to show to the Interreg community and to present to the Interreg community what the Territorial Agenda 2030 is all about and where there might be possible linkages, where the one can support the other. During this year, we have then um, gone to a, another format of work, which also Ms. Zainko in the introduction mentioned already. We have established an informal focus group, a focus group consisting of 15 to 20 people representing different Interreg programs, both cross-border, transnational and interregional programs, as well as national, regional representatives from the respective EU Council presidencies and others, as well as territorial actors. And with this focus group, we started working on the question, what makes Interreg, what makes an Interreg project really territorial? Um, the starting point of the discussion uh, was uh, to have a look at the program and the project life cycle. And the um, first key finding of the work in this focus group was that territoriality or territorial dimension is nothing which you find just at one or the other place, but it's something which in the best case you can find throughout the whole Interreg program life cycle and throughout the whole project life cycle. But what is also clear, became clear uh, when we worked on, on this, is that we need hands-on solutions. I mean, we cannot stop talking about uh, the territorial agenda as a piece of paper with objectives written down, objectives, uh, but we need hands-on solution how to make the territorial agenda 2030 really implementable and also implemented in everyday program and project reality. And one focus we had in this group was to look especially at the selection criteria when Interreg projects are uh, selected and uh, the question if they will receive funding. We quite quickly came to the conclusion there is no sense in developing yet another layer uh, of uh, criteria, but rather to take the existing selection criteria, which already are to some extent harmonized across the programs, to use these existing selection criteria and to rather develop a what we call territorial interpretation 
of the selection criteria so that the people in the joint secretaries assessing projects know what to look for um, if they want to define if a project has a territorial character, a territorial dimension. The starting point for uh, the work was, of course, to look into the territorial agenda itself, its overarching principles and priorities, and actually to compare uh, these with the policy objectives and specific objectives for Interreg programs in 21-27. If you put these next to each other, um, here you see a table, a part of a table we have developed. It becomes quite clear that you find the territorial agenda 2030 all over the policy objectives, specific objectives, and vice versa, which makes it just quite natural that interact programs and projects will take the territorial agenda 2030 into account in their programs and their projects. The next step is that we developed a, a matrix, and here again you see just part of it, a matrix uh, which actually links the program life cycle from programming, from phasing in the implementation later on, of course, the evaluation, the sustainability of programs, and defines for each of these steps the aspects which are about the territorial dimension. Here just highlighted that, of course, once a program is approved by the European Commission and has started implementation, um, the monitoring committees, for example, could or should regularly have a look at, is the program really working territoriality? Are the projects selected really having territorial dimension and territorial impact? This is just one aspect. There are many more in this table identified. And the same we did actually for the project lifecycle from the project generation, project assessment, funding decision, and further on. What are the different territorial aspects, elements, questions to be asked to find out if a project or to ensure that an interact project is really territorial. This is the work we have done with the, uh, our little uh, focus group uh, during this year, and we still continue working because the idea or the aim is that uh, by the end of the year, we would have a kind of package, supportive package um, with all kind of the, uh, various documents, guidances, suggestions, templates, which will actually help to make uh, the um, Territorial Agenda 2030 really implement it and show how interact programs and projects can do that. One thing which is still missing and which we will be working on still this year is to identify and to describe the territorial dimension throughout a couple of sample projects. So the idea is that we take two, three, obviously territorial projects, analyze them step by step to see what is really the territorial dimension of these projects to have really a hands-on example from the ground. Uh, on territoriality. And then the big issue will be, especially next year, bringing the territoriality package, this package which I mentioned, to the program practitioners. And this is a crucial, a crucial challenge, uh, I think, because uh, we had just another event on Monday where I also presented what we are doing and what we are aiming to do. And then I got a, a question, a comment from one of the participants asking that, very nice work, but isn't it all quite academic? Isn't it all a very academic discourse quite far away from the program and project implementation reality? Don't programs and projects have other problems, other issues to solve than a uh, theoretical discussion and interpretation of territoriality? And we came uh, also here with the focus group to the conclusion that the, the key is now to translate whatever we have uh, developed whatever we have uh, prepared to, to translate this into a day-to-day -day language to make all these findings uh, really applicable in day-to-day -day project life and program life. So this communication aspect, awareness raising, translating uh, maybe the uh, idea behind into hands-on and into something the practitioners can use, this will be core in uh, 22. Uh, one other aspect is, of course, that once uh, we have kicked off this process and uh, programs and projects start uh, supporting the uh, Territorial Agenda 2030, it would be interesting to find out and to monitor, not in the meaning of control, but a little bit to see how this worked out, what we came up with. So there we have started already internal discussion with our Keep.eu colleagues, that's our Interact Project database with, at the moment, 25,000 um, interact project since the year 2000. And this is definitely also an issue which nicely links to Mr. Zygodorowski speaking after me, where, of course, we 
could and should maybe also consider using uh, uh, joining forces with our colleagues from Aspen. And last but not least, uh, we want to return to uh, where we started. It's that, that we kicked off the whole um, issue last year with uh, talking about the notion of territoriality and the notion of functional areas. So we want to come back to this in uh, 22 under the French Council Presidency to um, organize an event where we will invite a, a number of functional areas to present actually themselves as the home turfs of best practice of territoriality, where you can really see how territoriality is applied in a day-to-day -day reality. And for this fifth point, actually, we have prepared a little poll, but this will come after my presentation. So this just uh, leaves me to say once again, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting us. And of course, we would be more than happy to receive your feedback, your questions, your ideas, your needs. Uh, so if you want to reach out to us, here you find both uh, the name address of my colleague, Werner Schausberger, and myself. Thank you very much for your attention. And now a question, and now a question first. The question is, do you know a functional area that could serve as a living example for territoriality? in the sense that we were talking about, as Philip Schwartz showed it. Any example that refers to territoriality? I'm quite interested in seeing the answers. Geopark Karavanke kot funkcionalno območje, Triglovski narodni park, Trigloveski park. Geopark Karavanke as a functional area, the Triglov National Park, any other that refers to the to a specific territory. Twin cities at German-Polish border, Maribor Graz, and the Drava cycling path, the mining region, for instance, the region of Zasauje or Schalek Valley, then the wine road in the wine region, the landscape park, the Ljubljana marshes, urban agglomerations in general, the connection between Nova Gorica in Slovenia and Gorizia in Italy, Osta Valley, then islands in Estonia, France, Belgium, Germany, Aosta Valley or Aosta surrounding cities and villages. Thank you very much. And now again, I would like to give the floor to Aya. And the next uh, speaker is Viktor Zidarovsky, who is the director of the ESPON program with 25 year experience in planning governance and implementing development initiatives with a dialogue and connecting into international partner network. He has long term experience in the introduction and development of international projects in the area of the Baltic Sea with the governments, with the development and research sectors, non-governmental organizations. And today he's going to speak about the territorial quality of life. We have discussed uh, quite at length as to how can we measure the quality of life. And it is ESPON that uh, significantly contributes to the information and inspiration of the policymakers and stakeholders on how to make the quality of life operational and included into the political processes. Mr. Zidarowski, the floor is yours inviting me to this event and this is you may understand also the important week in Slovenia we are having owing to the courtesy of the uh, our eminent hosts that were so kind to organize 
this week's events in physical shape. This has been very courageous, this has been very brave, but uh, we were very tempted and very eager to come and enjoy the, the, the real interaction, face-to-face -face interaction with all of you here also in this room. Uh, I'm going to present to you the work by Espon that I'm representing. This is, as Philip Schwartz was saying, yet another organization, yet another EU-funded program, but in contrast to Interact that deals with methodological support for uh, Interact programs and Interact communities, we deal with the territoriality in theory and also in practice. What we do is that we organize an exchange between researchers, spatial planners, territorial planners. We have Marco and the team that like the territory very much. We also have the ministry that is responsible for territorial matters. We have also the regions, the municipalities that have a mandate also to plan, to organize local planning and then the regional planning. So we try to connect the politicians, the practitioners, the researchers in better understanding about territorial trends, challenges, developments, what might happen in the future, what needs to be taken into account also in decision making. So I'm going to, probably I need to click something. Okay. I'm going to talk about one particular area of interest for ESPON, which is the quality of life. I think this is the topic that everyone is familiar with. The, the quality of life is seen, is felt, is briefed by every single individual in its specific way. If I ask you a question what the quality of life is about, I will probably get a lot of individual subjective answers. For someone, it's having a good car. For someone else, it's to be healthy. For someone else, it's to be safe and sound in terms of also personal safety. For some other people, it's having good job, good family. So we may ask, but I think this formulation is very abstract at the first hand and requires that we understand it better and also know how then to interpret the quality of life for policy making at all these different levels that my predecessors in this conference used to talk about. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to focus on what is the quality of life, why the quality of life is important to be taken by the respective policies, and how to measure the quality of life in theory and in practice, and then the connection to the Territory Agenda 2030 and other policies. And then later on, I will also briefly inform you about our work on the policy brief the quality of life. Which one I'm pointing? Yeah, okay. So this is just a very first attempt of scaling the quality of life. As mentioned, it's composed, it is composed of many different aspects. This is just a selection of those, transport accessibility, circular economy, food connections, climate adaptation, and so on. Of course, this is a non-exhaustive list but it gives a certain approximation of what we talk about, but again, it's very subjective, it's very individual. So why the quality of life? We have noticed, and also our decision makers, the responsible for launching this initiative, and I would point immediately at the Slovenian presidency of the EU Council, notice that the quality of life, the notion of the quality of life gets, receives more and more attention in policy making all levels. It's part of the EU policy framework in different strategic documents. It's also part of the renewed national spatial development policy of Slovenia. It also is important because there is a clear connection between the people's well-being and the quality of life. And also then, as mentioned, at different levels, it, it is more and more prominent in the policy documents. This concept is getting on certain flesh on the bone size, I would say, but again, it requires better understanding what in fact we talk about. Um, we notice also that the quality of life has a very distinct territorial dimension and also a very distinct citizen-based dimension. 
because probably what our policies have not been very efficient at was to try to find the answer to the question what bothers every single citizen. Why is that all places matter and all people matter, which has become a new slogan, as you know quite well. So we need to go down to the level of individual citizens, citizen groups, citizen communities. So at very minor scale to ask this question, what the quality of life is for you? How you feel about the quality of life? Is your life good enough? Do we need to change it as policymakers? Do we need to do something that we understand your needs and work on those needs? There is also a very clear territorial dimension in the fact that this perception if we make certain consensus on what is the quality of life in Maribor, what is the quality of life in, in Ljubljana, in Ptu, in many other areas, might differ. So there will be disparities between the way we understand the quality of life. It is within Slovenia, it is between Slovenia and the neighboring countries, it's also across Europe. So this is what we need to actually pay attention to, that there are differences and disparities. And also that it's not very easy then to understand quality of life because it's not just about environmental state or shape. It's not only about our social issues, issues or economic performance. It's everything combined. So our role as ESPON actually is the program that connects the researchers and practitioners and policymakers on delivering the better understanding of the territorial trends is also then to organize some pilot work on defining, measuring, and monitoring the quality of life. So our approach is to bring up this notion of territoriality into the quality of life. And we are going to do so by presenting a certain approach, which is the uh, territorial quality of life living lab. I will tell a little bit about what the living lab is about. Living means it's living, it's really dynamic, it's going, it's sustained. And lab because we experiment a little bit by connecting the people on the ground. And then we try then to interpret these different views together and also then to look at what are the good life enablers, what is behind the life maintenance, what's important for us to maintain our good life, and also life flourishing, how we can make our life even better. Yes, I need some helping hands sometimes here. So this is a conceptual map that I would, wouldn't like to, to bother you about at this stage, but all the different aspects and indicators that the people in such a quality of life, in, in such a living lab will be discussing, could be then translated into a sort of a matrix with indicators. The indicators that will try to pick up ourselves in this living lab, fill it with data, and then to, to try to interpret in terms how we do in and across the different territories. The, the Living Lab itself is an experiment, it's a pilot that we gather researchers, we gather practitioners, citizens, students, experts, and policymakers from the specific territory, and then try to then ask a certain question how we define the quality of life, what kind of indicators we could use in order to measure this quality of life, can we make an agreement about it, what kind of data exists to measure, to populate the indicators, and then also how to monitor and evaluate the quality of life. So at the end, we are also able to provide a helping hand as ESPON in the fact that one of our tools, the dashboard, can also demonstrate of the, how the result of this experimentation comes into the picture when comparing it with the different regions across Europe. Are we good enough in terms of our quality of life? Do we do well? Do we need to do something better? Because we can see that some regions that have similar characteristics or some municipal areas perhaps perform better because they are better off with something that is lacking in our case. So we can then try to compare, connect, organize an exchange and know better how we could use the expertise available in the other region, the other municipality to improve ourselves in our decision-making, in our policy framework. So this is the beauty 
that by some comparative analysis, we can get the knowledge on what we could do better in the future. So we are now, as mentioned, experimenting. We uh, organized a spin-off case of the ESPON analysis that uh, involves the cross-border region of coastal Karst region in Slovenia, Istria in Croatia and Trieste in Italy to gather these people, talk to them, and then to also understand the perception of the quality of life and see if, it, if it's measurable, if we can define it better, and then how to use it for the policy making. So the methodological aspect of that is the certain steps that we are carrying out right now, defining the area of interest, then identify our priorities, and then also the quality of life objectives. Can we subscribe to the certain priorities and objectives about our quality of life? Select the indicators to measure the, the quality of life objectives, identify the data, do the data exist, which is not a very easy thing very often to, to collect and compare, and then to map a certain political will or mission to, well, promote it, to put it into motion. Is there any good governance model already that we are having, that everyone is involved in implementing our quality of life priorities? Or do we need to involve someone who has been missing so far? So why this tool is so interesting? There are many ideas, there are many arguments why we should more and more be using the quality of life approach in our policy making because then the policies become easier to understand for the citizens, that they are not set top down, and then the citizens are just the subject, the, the object and not the subject. We involve citizens in decision making by understanding of what they really want, what they see as an important element of the quality of life. And also one important, perhaps very important, uh, argument is that we can also then address the so-called geography of discontent. As we know, this is not easy nowadays to put the decisions into the uh, operation. There is certain resistance, certain opposition, be it with vaccination or any other things that bother us on a daily life, in the daily life. So the geography of discontent is a sort of underpinning element or argument why this approach of involving citizens in discussing the quality of life should be actually essential. So our policy of life, our quality of life input paper that will be had helping hands, providing helping hands to the in decision making is going to be receiving certain inputs from our processes. Uh, there is already a working paper by ESPON that you can retrieve from the website that gives certain elements of imagination what the quality of life is about, how it is possible to measure it. We also organize a roundtable in Slovenia about the quality of life. Um, there will be also a joint workshop during the European Week of Regions and Cities, together with the Slovenian EU presidencies of the ministry, about whether our life is good enough and how we could then support the future for all places in Europe. There will be also an ESPON pilot lab where together with the Territory Agenda pilot action leaders that Daniel Melzian was talking about, we'll be trying to, to understand how these pilot actions took into account the quality of life aspects in their works and how they could do it in the future. And then as mentioned, there is this spin-off study for Slovenia, Croatia and Italy, the cross-border region that really experiments with the Territorial Quality of Life Living Lab concept. So this is our roadmap. So we do hope then when we come to Slovenia, once again for the ESCON week in late November, then we'll be proud to present to you the results of this experimentation, experimentation to really prove that this concept makes sense and it's useful in policy making. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victor. We are coming back to Menti once more. 
the question is posed a bit differently now. What use would be most beneficial for the territorial quality of life living lab? So what uh, Mr. Jidorowski has presented, we have three, three options. A better understanding how people know uh, quality of life, uh, discontent about regional policies, or to involve citizen groups in policy making based on their interests. See the answers are coming in, but the biggest part, I think that this tool is um, most beneficial to involve citizen groups in policy making based on their interests. I think this is an important piece of information. Thank you very much for your answers. And uh, once again, I give the floor to Ada. Thank you very much to our guests, to the interesting intro uh, to our event. Now we're coming to the central part. We'll have speakers presenting good practices uh, in priority areas of the TA 2030. Again, the public, so you will have the opportunity to pose questions. Uh, at first, we were planning to have Ms. Markic from Jezersko. Unfortunately, she could not make it. Uh, so now I would like to invite Mr. Albert Garcia Mazian. He's joining us remotely via Zoom. He is uh, the coordinator of EU project in the municipality of Mollet. He has coordinated multiple projects uh, concerning sustainable uh, food systems like Diet for a Green Planet and Agri-Urban, both uh, in Urban Act. He will talk about uh, food policy and territorial planning in Molet del Valles. People have managed to establish an uh, agricultural ecological project to have uh, economical stability of uh, people, protect the environment, and um, have a healthy lifestyle. Mr. Garcia Masian, the floor is yours. Morning to everybody in, in Slovenia, first of all, and in behalf of the municipality of Mulet Alvarez, let me tell you that we are very grateful for your invitation to this very interesting and very well arranged meeting. So I will share my screen. So I guess that you're seeing my presentation. So our project started with an expropriation that took place during the aftermath of the dictatorship regime of Franco. This is during the late uh, 70s in Spain. Uh, it was an expropriation that affected 1,500 hectares and the idea was to build a satellite city from Barcelona of 130,000 inhabitants. There were six municipalities affected by this expropriation, but ours was the most affected. And, and the, uh, the effect was like uh, the expropriation affected 50% of our territory. So luckily, Franco passed away, democracy arose in Spain, but as a downside, everyone forgot about this expropriation and this area become a real backyard. So with prostitution problems, with lo all, lots of garbage everywhere, and during two decades, it was really abandoned. In all this darkness, there was a, bit, a little bit of light and it was our populations. There were a lot of demonstrations from associations trying to convince public administration to protect this area and they managed to do so in 2005 when we established a consortium, a consortium called CAIEX, and that gathers six municipalities and the Catalan government. Once we managed to protect the territory together with our community, we decided what projects should be launched there. And we did what we call in the province of Barcelona, an agricultural park. Why did we choose agriculture? 
well because agriculture uh, humanizes the city surroundings, uh, protect and support the environment, act as a green lung for the metropolitan area of Barcelona, and the most important, give an opportunity to make a way of living for the people living in this peri-urban area. And we always try to reach a balance, of course, with the natural and environmental functions, as well with the educational and leisure ones, taking into account that there is a quarter of a million people living around these 750 hectares that we managed to uh, protect. And this is our little treasure, as we say. So we decided to go for a model of agricultural approach because it was as a means to guarantee economic viability and also a better integration with our natural values of the area. Maybe you are familiar with agroecology, but it stands on the recovery of local and ancient varieties because they are better adapted to our climate. We have managed to recover more than 30 varieties of, of uh, vegetables and legumes, then soil conservation. That's why we are producing organic. Then biodiversity is also a very important topic for us. We speak about cultivated biodiversity here in Barcelona, taking into account that during the time that this area was abandoned, agriculture was reduced to one crop for animal feeding. I think it was barley. And today we are feeding humans and we are producing more than 19 different crops. Of course, we are producing healthy and quality food, and then we reach the economic viability. This is very important. The manager of the consortium always tells me, Albert, the most important protection is not to avoid urban pressure, which is very important in almost a metropolitan area of a big city, but it's to give the possibility for the people that live there to remain in this very urban area and to make a way of living. And of course, the environmental protection. How did we manage to launch an agricultural uh, project in this peri urban area? First of all, we have also the support of the University of Barcelona. They identified the best soil and they gave also some agricultural planning support to our local producers. Then, another important topic is the long term stability suppressing urban development, of course. We have a triple protection in this area, local, regional and national, understanding national as the Catalan government from the autonomous community. At local level, we have our urban management plan that identifies this area as a protected area. And for example, at national level, we have a legal figure that in Catalan it's called PEAN, which would be like a Nature 2000, but with lower requirements. Then we granted also some licenses to, to access to public land because due to the expropriation, all this amount of land, it's public. And of course, it's not only about producing food. There are also other related businesses like agro-tourism, environmental education, etc. In this slide, you can see what we produce in the area, but what's more important are the brands on the right side. We created the brand of Producta de Gallex. Gallex is the name of this peri-urban area, organic and locally food. And then we convinced our local producers to create an association and to work in a cooperative way. Then we invested some public funds in an agro shop to help them to sell their produce and also in a workshop where they transform their vegetables, for example, in vegetables, creams, etc. So we have land protection, we have support with agricultural planning, with the association in public investment. And then the third leg, the third pillar would be the government governance from public administration. So already a decade ago, we identified Gallex in our city strategic plan we led 2025 as our flagship project as i told you before we are only located 15 kilometers away from barcelona and to have 50 percent of your territory protected give you a unique profile as a city and improve the quality of life of our citizens of course also in our term action plans during many years we always have been including uh, actions to support our local producers to promote the area, the multi-level uh, governance that has been speaking other speakers today, the consortium itself, Catherine, six municipalities, local level, the Catalan government at, at national level. Then we created also a food group at internal level in the municipality, aligning resources and actions with technicians from different departments. And the next one is very important. I know that we have been talking for years with the bottom-up approach, but 
to engage the food stakeholders in the city was the only way to create this sense of belonging to the outputs of these political documents. And then the European dimension has been very important for us as well. We have been joining to urban projects. And thanks to that, we have managed to develop a local food policy back in 2015. We learned a lot from a Swedish municipality called Sodetelier, located very close from Stockholm. As we are located very close from Barcelona. We developed new public procurement models Models to guarantee access to this locally produced uh, food to our public canteens. We signed what is called the Moyet Manifesto. It's a commitment of 11 mayors from small and medium sized European cities towards sustainable food systems. We also developed a uh, food and health mid long term strategy in the, in the city. I will elaborate a little bit more on that later on. And then we are joining the food charter of the metropolitan region of Barcelona. Of course, when it comes to food, as in many of the topics, you need the regional scale. So our agricultural park is not unique in the province of Barcelona. There are, I think, 14 agricultural parks, very well connected, that cooperates during the whole time. So our integrated action plan with all food-related stakeholders, we dreamed about the, our city in the future, and it should be a city with an animated and organic local agri-food economy that, that uh, has connections between growers and experts, and the most important, to empower our citizens through education to choose nutritious and sustainable food as a part of a healthy lifestyle. It is a very extensive document, but just let me tell you that it's structured in three main areas, the brand Eat Well in Mollet, targeting health promotion, and then to targeting local economy, scale up our produce, and to promote entrepreneurship among the agricultural sector. Last but not least, one and a half minute to share with you some success stories. So I invite uh, you to check the QR code when the presentations will be sent. First of all, the picture with the X, it's just an excuse to tell you that we have been targeting young women to, to run their new businesses in the agricultural sector, and we have been quite successful. Then we have uh, been awarded by the European Commission, DG Sante, with, with an award for health promotion for healthy lifestyles in the city, for a large project that we run in all primary schools where we connected all our students with the food chain, uh, visiting our producers, local retailers, indoors markets, and then the last visit for us, it's always the health system, the city hospital, because, because when we work the food system in our city, we always include the, the health sector, where dietitians taught our students the impact that an unbalanced diet can have in your health. You have also a picture of some community gardens that we have, because this project in the periurban area has been as a beacon of inspiration and has been spreading also in the urban areas. So we have plenty of community gardens across my city and the other ones. And the last one is that today we are joining a Horizon 2020 project that has given us the possibility to set up a school of organic production for our producers where they are learning more in, and they have the possibility to access to some test plots to, to keep improving their their skills in, in this area. And we are also connected with other schools in Tunisia, Morocco, Turkey, with some climate similarities. So if there is someone in the audience really interested in the topic, I will be very pleased to be in contact with you, to share documents, videos, whatever you need. Thank you very much to all of you. And uh, another question via the internet. Do you buy locally produced food? So this is the first question. Everyone, almost to 100% for now. Well, there is one person who is not buying locally produced food. Well, there are several now. Okay, so if I may comment on, on the results, 
I don't know if I am allowed or not. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Bang. Okay. No, because I, I answered these questions to elaborate a little bit more. I have to say that I'm very, very surprised of, of the answer because it's not the, the average answer across Europe, I would say, but I'm very happy because if you buy local, you know, this is good for the climate, this is good for the economy, this is good for your health, etc. Sometimes to buy local that I, I thought that, you know, the results would be upside down, you know, that the 19 would be in the no. Sometimes it's complicated to access the local food in big supermarkets and, and just wanted to add one a minute that at regional level in the province of Barcelona, we are developing a project that in which we are inviting all the producers from Catalonia to send the produce to the Barcelona city to a very big terminal in order to solve some distribution problems that you have sometimes, you know, when you are a little farmer. Kvala. Uh, imamo še eno vprašanje povezano na to temo. Um, zakaj ljudje ne kupujejo več lokalno pridelene hrane? There's another question. Why don't people buy locally produced food more? More often? What could be the answer? Because it is more expensive. Exactly. That, that, that's one of the of the main answers that we get when we speak about local and organic food and this can be true but there are several ways you know trying to lower the price huh? of course in public canteens it's, it's much easier but i mean if there are some groups you know that purchase food for our farmers as well and if you guarantee that you will purchase him you know in a regular basis during the whole year for example you can lower the price to help them to distribute that with some public investments would also lower the price. But at the end, I, maybe I, it is a reckless comment, huh? but I want to add this as well, that uh, sometimes we are ready to pay, you know, like 600 euros for a mobile phone or 1,000 euros for a laptop, but with food, sometimes, you know, it's, it's more complicated for people to understand that healthier food, mm, the food that you pay, you know, like, decent wages for the producers and decent prices, then it's a little bit more expensive. But I think that it's uh, a mindset change that we should start doing. Thank you very much. Uh, the price is listed as the main factor and uh, accessibility. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Albert. And now, Ada. And now I would like to welcome Oliver Horini in our midst. Ever since 2013, he has been employed in the Upper Elbe Transport Association in Dresden and he's responsible for the tariff or ticketing system of the public transport. He helped develop new tickets. We are going to listen to his presentation of the Elbe Labe cross-border ticket system. The region along the upper Elbe river on both sides of the Saxony Bohemian border has always been closely connected. However, there was no common system of ticketing for cross-border travels. And the presentation will show how they introduced this new ticketing system and what were the challenges of this important step. Please, Mr. Horeni, the floor is yours. Dobadam, and welcome everyone here in Maribor and the colleagues who uh, watch remote. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to be able uh, to present the Elbe Labe ticket system here in Maribor. We can... I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the Elbe Labe region. That's why I brought these two maps. You can see the map of Germany and Czech Republic and the river Elbe, which has its spring in the giant mountains and then continues through Czech Republic and Germany. There are two regions highlighted in blue, which is the VVO, Verkehrsverbund Oberelbe, I'm working for. And in green, it's on the Czech side, 
the uh, yeah, similar structure of a transport association. It's called Dobrava Ustetskoho Kraja. On the right side, you see a bigger map of these two regions. On the German side, there is the Saxon capital Dresden in the center of uh, our transport association. Dres Dresden has approximately 550,000 inhabitants and in the whole blue area live approximately 1.2 million inhabitants. On the Czech side, the district capital is called Ustinad Laban, which has approximately 100,000 inhabitants. And the area you see is also the validity area of the ticket I'm going to present later on. You might now ask what connects these two regions. In the middle of these two regions, exactly by the border, is a picturesque landscape. It's called Saxon and Bohemian Switzerland because it reminded the first people on Switzerland. This is a recreational area, not only for tourists who come from all over Europe there, but also for the people who live there, exactly for uh, Dresden inhabitants who go there for hiking trips or uh, bicycle trips along the river. But there's more than this. Dresden is also very attractive for Czech people who do their retailing services in Dresden. And vice versa, the Czech Republic is very attractive for people from Germany, especially the gastronomy, some services for daily life, but also for recreational uh, reasons like winter sport. The transport system between these two regions is um, quite of a high standard, I would say. First of all, there's the international railway line from Berlin via Prague to Vienna, which crosses Dresden and the Elbe Valley. And since 2014, there's another local train line, which is depicted in red here. It starts in the northernmost part of Czech Republic, in the town of Rumburg, and crosses the border first near Sebnitz, then continues to a German uh, part of this region, and then crosses the border a second time to into Czech Republic, and uh, finally terminates in Děčín. This is a really interesting example because the people from the northern part of Czech Republic, from this little corner you can see there on the right, um, had to take detours before this uh, railway line was reopened. So their journey time to their um, biggest city in this northern part of Jechin could be diminished with the opening of this railway line over German territory. Above this, there's another express um, train line on weekends from Dresden to Litomierschitze and vice versa to serve um, especially the day tourists and um, people from Czech Republic who do their shoppings in Dresden. And above this, there are free cross-border bus lines and um, the special um, cross-border ferry we have on the Elbe between uh, the station of uh, Schöna and a small Czech village uh, called Rensko on the other side of the Elbe. So the network has been basically there for almost centuries, I would say, but before the joint ticket system was introduced, it was really hard for people to use public transport uh, when they wanted to go uh, cross-border. So they had to buy several tickets, maybe a tram ticket in Dresden, then an international train ticket uh, to Czech Republic, and uh, maybe another bus ticket if they wanted to continue in Czech Republic. Above this, they had to struggle with two different currencies, um, and they still have nowadays if, um, if they cannot make use of uh, this uh, ticketing system I'm going, I'm going to introduce. There were several, okay. there were several um, problems with understanding the 
tariff conditions, conditions of carriage, and there wasn't one source where the travelers could uh, look up what means a family ticket, how do you define a family? So each transport company had its own uh, rules and um, it was really not appealing for people to use public transport. The good news is things can improve when neighbors talk to each other. As you might know, like Slovenia, also Czech Republic joined the European Union in May 2004 and the Schengen area in December 2007. But already in November 2007, we introduced the Elbe Labe ticket. On the German side, the structure is quite the same as like in 1998, when the VVO, the Upper Elbe Transport Association, was founded. On the Czech side, there wasn't such a similar structure by then. So it, the development of the Elbe Labe ticket depended on only a few well-motivated people who traveled from door to door, hired a translator, and convinced all the transport companies in the Czech Republic to join this ticketing system. But this was quite successful, as I said, because in 2007, the Elbe Lava ticket was introduced. In 2016, a similar structure like in Germany has been introduced in the Czech Republic. Since then, there is this transport association called um, Doprava Ustetskoho Kraje, which tenders the public transport services and sets the standards. So since then, things have become easier and we could bring the Elbe Labe ticket to a new standard. So this is the assortment we provide so far. It's a day ticket, which is valid uh, from the time of validation to the very next day, 4 a.m. in the morning. And we offer it for single persons who can take along two pupils. We offer it for families, it means two adults and four pupils. We offer it for small groups of five persons, no matter how old they are. And there's also a ticket for bicycles and dogs. Now, the interesting part is the price. There's a euro price and the price in Czech rounds. And it depends on where you buy it. So you cannot buy a ticket for Czech rounds in Germany and vice versa. If you are a good calculator, you might see that the Czech price is lower uh, if you transfer it into Euro. So the exchange rate is 1 to 25. That means that the day ticket in Czech rounds equals to 12 Euro, which is, um, is much lower than the Euro price. And uh, what the reason for this is, I'm going to explain on the next slide. So there are three different interests we have by setting the price. The first is, yeah, the price should be accepted by the people, um, otherwise it's senseless. But on the other side, there are the interests of the transport companies in terms of uh, the revenue should be enough. And thirdly, we need to avoid the cannibalization of um, higher price tickets. And I told you already the solution, uh, we managed that, that you cannot buy um, tickets for Czech crowns in Germany. And you can also not bring them from Czech Republic to Germany as they are immediately valid on the day of, the, uh, of this sell. Yeah, that is quite successful, that system, but um, so far, it hampers the implementation in uh, mobile ticketing systems. At least it, uh, it would be possible for euro prices, um, but as soon as we introduce that for check grounds, we would have this cannibalization effect again. Yeah, I brought, brought you two figures from um, two of the tickets. On the left side, you see the single ticket. On the right side, the small group ticket. 
I'm afraid that the COVID situation um, didn't show a, um, um, a success of uh, the ticket. But if you, uh, if you have a look at the 2019 line, which was before COVID, you can see the differences in the two tickets. While the ticket on the left side has its highest peaks during summer, when the tourists are in the region, um, when they are animated to do hiking trips, um, this is our best seller. But when you look at the small group ticket, you can see this drastic increase in uh, end of November and December. This is why a lot of Czech people travel to the German Christmas markets in Dresden and they do their Christmas shop, um, shoppings there. And as they do, don't do that alone, they bring colleagues and friends and family and that's why they um, buy these small group tickets. Yeah, that's it so far. I was, as I said, pleased to introduce you this ticket and um, I hope I could inspire some of you. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Do we have any questions from our viewers? So not even not only for Oliver, maybe anyone else. Thank you very much. I have a question for Mr. Oliver. Is this is a very interesting project. Uh, Cross-border readers face such problems a lot of times when it comes to urban transit. But the problem is that we hardly address daily migrants. In your case, your project has been aimed at tourists and people going for leisure. So you were not addressing daily migrations from Germany to Czech Republic. So that could maybe be a next phase of project development in uh, your context. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. You're completely right. We uh, face also um, um, a border crossing on a daily basis by a lot of commuter, com yeah, commuters. There are a lot of Czech people, for example, working in the retailing uh, business in Dresden. There's a, a grammar school, which is bilingual for Czech and uh, German students. And so there are really reasons to cross the border on a daily basis. And uh, for these people, this Elbe ticket is not attractive enough. So we know that we have to work on this for like monthly passes or annual passes or something like this. Yeah, there's uh, still a lot of work to do. Any other questions? Yes, please. Jožikos Grabar, Zoom Maribor. Če se ne motim, imajo smočišče na Mariborskem pohorju, tu blizu. My name is Jožikos Grabar from Zoom. As far as I know, we have a pohorje in the vicinity and they have a ticketing system. Mr. Excuse me, I have forgotten your name. Horini, yes. What would be your recommendation to reach a joint skiing ticket for multiple ski resorts uh, goes also for uh, any other unified system. Where do you see the biggest problems um, judging from your experience and what are the main solutions coming from your findings that could be applicable in similar uh, situations, not, not only skiing tickets, but also other unified transit systems. What are your main um, tips 
for uh, such activities. I hope I was uh, clear enough. If not, I can uh, give the question in uh, English as well. Thanks for your question. I think it's not easy to compare uh, skiing uh, tickets for ski lifts with public transport because public transport has also another task. It has to ensure mobility for people and um, the price acceptance is higher for skiing lifts, I would guess so. Um, so it should be a bit easier to, to, to find a price and um, um, to come to a solution uh, when you talk about skiing passes. But still, the, the most important thing is um, to bring the people together onto a table and uh, show them the, um, the benefits they can have when, uh, when they introduce such a ticket system, no matter if it is for public transport or for, for skiing, because the, the market you can reach with such a cross-border ticket gets much bigger than if you only concentrate on, on the local um, spot. So as I said, in my case, it uh, was a bunch of people who were really motivated and thought that this is a good thing and they convinced the players on the other side of the border to do that. And I think this is still necessary um, also in the case you illustrated. So, and if you have questions for the technical applications, I think we can talk later on. Uh, can you just stay here a little bit, Oliver? We have a question online. Uh, maybe I can bring it up here for you. Um, so, Edward is asking which company operate the joint ticket system and if there is full technical interoperability between these two systems. Well, the tickets are sold by every transport company who accepts the ticket. So you can buy them at the bus driver, at vending machines, at sales points, um, yeah, except for um, mobile apps. They are everywhere accessible. The tickets look different between Germany and Czech Republic, but um, this is actually not a big problem because the uh, controllers, um, the conductors in the trains are um, familiar with, with the, this uh, difference. This is not the problem. And uh, yes, yeah. it continues. So far, uh, they are not electronically um, readable by each other. So this is also a thing we have to work on to ensure this um, e-ticket in the future. So there is a continuation to that uh, question. So is there cross-border tickets specific for the region or can it be used on national transport lines as well? Um, well, I'm not sure whether I understand this question correct. You could also make use of this ticket without crossing the border. So if you stay in the German region, for example, you can do that. And we uh, observed this behavior in Czech Republic before this transport um, association was founded because there wasn't a similar ticket which covered the Czech area only. So people there used the Elbe Labe ticket to travel within their area. And you can make use of all lines except the um, international train lines, like the Eurocity is um, not within the service of the Elbe Labe ticket. Thank you. We have concluded the first part of the conference. Thank you, dear guests, for uh, your presentation and guests for your uh, attention. I now invite you to a coffee break and we meet again at 11.15.
unfortunately, we're not getting any audio from the room, uh, which is why we cannot interpret. Okay, now we have uh, the presentation of Katarzyna Simczak Pomianowska from Wroclaw. She will talk about the um, climate change adaptation in Wroclaw and she will answer quite a few questions at this topic. Uh, Katarzyna should be present here. No. Okay. Maybe she will join us later. Okay. Then I will give the floor to Mr. Igor Kos. He was consulted at uh, WeCycle, part of the Regional Development Agency of Podravia. His uh, passion is circular economy, and that is why he wants to develop a business model of uh, circular economy in Maribor. He helped prepare the strategy, the transition strategy to a circular economy in 2018. His presentation is circular economy in the Podravska region, as Maribor was one of the first cities uh, to tackle circular economy, not only in Slovenia, but in the whole EU. The plan is step by step coming to fruition. And this is also shown in the founded Institute We Cycle, which is uh, now part of the Regional Development Agency of Podravia. His vast knowledge and experience will help 41 municipalities to transition to circular economy. The floor is yours, Mr. Kos. Hello and welcome to Maribor. This is my hometown. So just recently, the change happened. The institute that was founded in April 2017 has now become part of the Regional Development Agency in 2019. And uh, we have done quite a lot of work, as you will see in our timeline. A lot of activities have taken place with all stakeholders and everyone who helped in this development. So let me continue with my presentation. So first, the timeline. The Institute was founded in April of 2017, but the activities in the field of circular economy have started, started much before by preparing the strategy for the development as part of the cohesion policy framework from 2014 to 2020. And we showed there how we see the development in the city of Maribor. From the mayor's cabinet, where I was responsible for the sustainable development in the city, I came to the Institute. So there was a two level approach in the field of governance and in the field of implementation of circular economy. Governance is drawn here at the bottom of the slide and the implementation through various projects is shown on the upper side of the slide of the main line. As it was said in the introduction, in 2018 we drafted the strategy for the transition of the city of Maribor to circular economy. So we had the, it was presented at the European circular economy platform. We are sharing our knowledge and expertise, our experience and the topics we are dealing with. Together with the circular change from Ljubljana and the former commissioner, the European Commission, we also prepared a um, signpost for the transition to the circular economy and formed the partnership 
in this area. Perhaps we were lucky, but the brave ones are always accompanied by luck. So we could connect the local, regional and the national levels. The partnership in the framework of the urban agenda has been beneficial and I hope it will continue in the future because it showed as an opportunity that both cities, regions and the government could sit together with the representatives of the European Commission, with the Euro cities, with the investment bank, with ACR plus and others. So different stakeholders could discuss the issue and prepare an action plan, plan that was in part implemented within the Green Deal of the European Union. On the side of the implementation in 2017, we also started with the practical implementation of circular economy in Maribor through the first project, Interreg Alpine Space. The title was The Green Cycle. Through this, we co-financed co the drafting of the strategy. We obtained European funds for the development of the strategic document or framework for the city municipality of Maribor. A great breakthrough, which we were very pleased about, was the approval of the project Urban Soil for Food. I would like to welcome our colleague in our midst who ha has helped us for three years in the implementation of this project, Mrs. Brina Lazar. And we've gained international visibility. And you can see that in the number of projects that were launched as a result. In the city of Maribor, we wish to obtain even more of such projects. These projects addressed different areas. Primarily, we wanted to enable the five companies who participated in the establishment of this framework of this strategy to implement the five business models through demonstrations. In the Urban Soil for Food project, the company Snaga mixed two substances, biological waste and soil from construction. They use the pyrolytic process together with the Institute of, for Construction of Slovenia to get fertile soil that can be used for the maintenance of green areas in the city. In the Horizon 2020 Cinderella, there was a company Nigrad that demonstrates the construction of a building from construction waste, as well as the road leading to the building and other uh, facilities. Uh, this is going on in Dogoshe. There are also some soft contents where the Maribor water Waterworks, water supply network um, is proceeding with the digitalization of their services with regard to waste collection or with the direction of water supply in the city. We all hope that the rainwater can be used so that this will reduce pressure to the use of drinking water. These are the projects that have been underway or implemented. As you can see also, municipal companies are part of it, are participating in it. We try to also include non-governmental organizations, national institutes and all experts that formed part of the network that would be successful in implementing these projects. Then DEAR program has a project called Food Wave 
It's about empowering urban youth for climate action. It's about the young people aged 11 to 35. It's about food waste, about climate change, about food surplus, surpluses and so on. As there was a lot of talk today about the territorial approach to the use of space, I need to say that this was one of the first topics that we discussed with our municipal companies, with our utility companies. And we talked about how to improve the infrastructure, because if it is done right, it can give better effects. And if it is done in a wrong way, then it can create and increase costs. In the urban areas, as well as in the functional area of the city, we are trying to bring new contents, new substance in order to have optimum services available. At the left side of the slide, you have the title Roadmap towards the Circular Economy in Slovenia. And to the right of this slide, it's the indicators that we were using for measuring. We worked mainly in three areas, better financing, better knowledge and better legislation. These were the three strands that we worked on. Within the scopes, we also gave recommendations to the European Commission when it comes to bottlenecks, especially as regards uh, legislation so that we would enable different business models and test possible solutions. We were very pleased to see that with the European Investment Bank, we made a breakthrough in the understanding of the financing of the circular projects, unlike linear projects. The business models are different now and they are evaluated also in a different way than in the past. We were also very pleased that during the COVID-19 pandemic, together with our partners, ICLE, European Investment, Investment Bank, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, UN Environment Programme and so on, we managed to draw up the European Circular Cities Declaration. Currently, more than 60 cities have signed this declaration. So we are facilitating in the, the development of the network, the international network of cities that strive towards European cities for circular development. And of course, Every city is invited to join. And now circular economy in pictures. There have been some hundred or so projects underway. So ever since visiting our institute, when where we had a photo wall with the goals of our sustainable and circular development, in the picture, in the upper left corner of the slide, you can see the visit of the U.S. Embassy representatives in our institute. Then we organized the events, bring and change or replace, and we rewarded those who brought their used things and replaced them with other secondhand things. In the Urban Soil for Food program, we used 12,000 square meters of land uh, who are now used for gardens by people living in the city. They come to, to the area and cultivate the land and grow their own produce. But people just need to be activated. There should be more of such activities. And through these projects, we also found out how much an activation of such a space may cost. And this area is around 100,000 euro. 
So this is land that has not been used. So in the long run, it is sustainable. We've organized several conferences to promote the circular economy. So this is just a summary of our activities at several levels. We dealt with the implementation and with the promotion and education in the field of the circular economy. We wish to raise awareness both of the decision makers who have a direct impact on the decisions taken in the scope of the circular development. And we also wish to improve the green procurement. The public buyers may want to ask for a green, for a sustainable service and solution. And there's a lot of potential in it because of the circular economy. And now a look into the future. Of course, we did not stop with the transfer to the regional development agency. We started with the upsurge project and together with partners, we had a kickoff meeting in Blit in Slovenia. In October and November this year, we are going to have a live meeting in the physical format with the project partners in Maribor. And the topic of this project is the implementation of nature-based solutions. And the demonstration area will be the Pekar, Pekres stream there was a participatory approach already launched and unfortunately within the scope of this strategy it is not going to be finalized perhaps 20 percent of the renovation of the park around this stream will be renovated and redesigned and just, so it means just one segment will be redesigned and we will demonstrate nature-based solutions there and nature-based planning. We are also going to position sensors for the for, for monitoring air quality there. And the participatory approach will promote the measuring of air quality by the citizens themselves with their micro sensors. So we will be able to collect this, this data and put it, enter it into the platform. We wish to mobilize the neighboring areas and facilities that are in the vicinity of the regional development agency to the left and to the right of the arrow the buildings are owned by the regional development agency and now we are drafting programs for different uh, stakeholders in the city for the chamber of the economy prisma and other institutes and ngos and also for the creative sector we wish to activate those buildings and give them new substance and activate the circular economy approach in them. We wish that for this to become only one point for the promotion of the circular economy approach, uh, we wish there should be more in the region in order for the citizens and people living in the region would have better access to the information. We also wish to raise awareness on why is it necessary to transition to the circular economy and what are the benefits of that. And by way of conclusion, a thought by Pete Seger. I hope that we will also start acting and behaving in a way expressed in this thought. 
and I'm available for questions when the time allows it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Igor. Any questions, maybe? Yes, here we go. Thank you for this very interesting presentation and the demonstrations of what can be done in the field, as well as ways in which circular economy can be implemented on the ground. My question here, oh, I'm, I'm speaking uh, Croatian, uh, should I ask in English? Okay, then I'll continue Croatian. Which are uh, the funding sources or are you just getting budget, so national funds or local regional funds or have you gotten for the last projects any other funds, so from any European sources of funding? And my other question, which is the time projection to finish the project. Of course, we will follow it closely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, the Institute was financed without any budget funding. We were not using any budget funds from the uh, city municipality. We did not receive any transfers from the five funding companies who were our owners until September. The Institute has financed itself. So we were not a financial burden to the space we were working in. So we were funded through European projects like partners in projects and used funds that were available. Of course, we had to finance the participatory parts that we got in the market with, uh, through projects. And in our first two years of working, we tried to assure the basic demands for working of the Institute. And through the system of community uh, financing was in place and we did not want to put any other items through that and it was not feasible uh, to finance the functioning of our institute in that way. So we decided to take an innovative approach. Uh, so we did not want any budget uh, funds and no transferred. So the five partners that uh, where our owners gave us a one-time 10,000 euro uh, grant and everything else we had to uh, earn in the market and make sure that in the past four years we stay um, liquid. Now we are part of the regional development agency where we manage other projects that are uh, were approved. So we have financing for future projects generally. Let's not go into details here. We wish that this would happen as soon as possible. We want, we have to prepare project documentations, which goes hand in hand. And the plan is that until the end of this year, we finish the content approach and then we would like to follow up with the demonstration of circular economy with nature natural uh, materials or those who have come through circular economy like uh, insulation like um, hemp or other materials that have been processed like in maribor we have 
insulation for both sound and temperature uh, for car seats. In a similar manner, uh, we would like to bring new uh, information in our area that there is another way to doing things. I now give the floor to Anit Numa. She lived and studied in different uh, countries and learned to appreciate uh, living in a digital uh, society. She even spent some time in Slovenia. She studied uh, political sciences and now has good cooperation uh, skills between uh, public and private sectors. She will be talking about the digitalization as a tool for territorial cohesion in Estonia. Estonia connected fast and well their e-governance and has a simple approach to uh, services, no matter the location of their user, how they managed and what the worth of this uh, manageable ecosystem is. She will tell us in her presentation. So hello to everybody and um, also very good afternoon from my side here. I'm personally absolutely delighted to be joining here today here. There is one personal reason and also one professional reason. I will start with the personal reasons and I can say that exactly today, seven years ago, I moved to Slovenia and I started my studies here at the University of Ljubljana. So I'm very, very delighted to be back here and to see my home city, which gave me wings. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to join you today here. Uh, by the professional reason, I'm also delighted to represent here the Estonian government where I work and, and talk about how Estonia has made it possible to everybody to live wherever they want to. If it's a tiny island, somewhere 300 kilometers away from the capital city, or if it's a small, very beautiful village that maybe has a view like this, which is my favorite a book that we have in Estonia. So if you ever happen to come and visit, and I can also get everything done today uh, when I would be even staying there, um, because talking about the Estonian e-governmental system today, so there is only two governmental services that are not available on, on uh, online yet. And this is just getting married and divorced. But I do sincerely hope that that doesn't happen too much in your life, that you would have to uh, go to this kind of services. So the rest of things are fully functioning online. And this really has made our people, um, I would say, much more flexible when it comes to their decisions wherever they want to live. And I guess everybody here in the room would fully agree with me that the time of pandemic really changed our behavior also. Um, maybe maybe to kick off here and, and to start the question from the audience, how many of you in the room, uh, by the time when pandemic started, moved somewhere in a countryside? Raise the hands. Did anybody move to the countryside uh, by the time of pandemic? There were only a few hands. I'm very surprised. All right, we do have more hands here. I was one of them as well. And, and again, I could continue my life in the exact same way because the government had provided me the same level of services. Doesn't matter where I was in a capital city or somewhere in the middle of the forest. And this is essential. But now I would like to make, um, yeah, I have to guess, click that one here. Uh, all right, <laughs> no. All right, um, just to give you a very, very quick overview where Estonia today stands and what would be my recommendations, because the place where I work at the Estonia Briefing Center, we consult especially not the Estonian government, but we consult the other governments and local municipalities, how to really create a fully uh, invisible environment when it comes to uh, governmental services. So uh, the first thing, obviously, when somebody wants their people to be more flexible is to provide a very good connectivity and connectivity is the main word today. So um, if you think back Estonia 30 years ago, I would say Slovenia and Estonia are very similar with their background. Exactly 30 years ago, Estonia regained, uh, restored its independence and the same happened also here in Slovenia 30 years ago. Um, I, I would say again, our uh, situation was similar back in 91. We were not the richest countries in Europe. Estonia was very much struggling with a very tiny budget, so we couldn't have much of a fun by building bureaucracy. And we all know bureaucracy is very expensive to have. 
And, and of course, also, we still wanted to provide our people a chance to uh, get access to governmental services, even when they live in, in, again, small, tiny villages. But having these public institutions in every single small village, we couldn't afford that. This was crazy expensive. So we had a choice whether we're going to do something else or going to continue doing things in the exam, exam, exa, exact same way and get our people mad at us. We decided that technology is going to help us here. As a first step, we signed an agreement with our wonderful friends from Sweden who helped us to cover Estonia with a very good internet connection. And to, today, you can't find a place in Estonia where you wouldn't be able to connect yourself to internet. I can tell you today that. And, and as I said, 99% of the things are working fully online. And since the year 2002 or already, Estonia also introduced the electronic identity card so that we can use this safe way of authentication whenever we want to use um, any kind of services. Uh, so almost in the past 20 years, we have had that solution. And, uh, and, and just some random facts as well to show you here that security remains still um, as the most important element um, and that's why Estonia was the first country who even started using blockchain on a national level to make sure that the integrity of our data uh, when people do things online is also provided. Um, and many, many politicians, uh, I don't think we have many of uh, politicians here in the room today with me, but usually when they visit Estonia, they come with a question, okay, I'm going to go home on it now. What should I tell my voters if um, we want to use technology in our state? And I would say uh, we've got some great numbers. Um, because again, um, money and budget are very important. And um, I can say that today, just by providing online signatures, Estonian government saves around 2% of GDP every single year. I'm talking about 2% of GDP, which is equal to the money we spend on defense and security. And just because people can sign documents online without having to provide anything on paper today. And by the citizen aspect, it's five days per year. And then we go back again. I can still be uh, living in an island because I don't have to show up at the capital city to provide my signature at the tax and custom board because I can do that from there. And this is what we need today. We want to be flexible and not only internally in one state, but of course also sometimes even traveling. And to show you how crazy we went with this entire digitalization, then also in a couple of weeks, we're going to have our local elections. And even if I would stay here in Slovenia, I would be able to participate in our local elections because we have been voting by using iVoting application in the past 16 years. And the number is increasing all the time. Last time when we had elections, it was 46% of people who voted by using this online platform. I'm expecting this number to be at least 55% this time. So if anybody wants to bet with me here, then I would be able to like, uh, negotiate with you with this number here. But um, now to uh, move over here, I also wanted to bring it out what's actually important when you start building online services. First of all, you need to build a trust. And this is what we started doing in the very beginning of the times. And by meaning trust is that every single information and data we store about our citizen belongs to them, not to us in the governmental sector. And Estonia, very uniquely, is also providing its citizens a solution called Data Tracker, which means that any time of the day, I can log into my state portal and see exactly which government agency at what time of the day has been looking for which part of my information? 24 hours. And if I see something there on the list that I'm like, wow, I don't know why tax and custom board should be looking at my information today. I can report about that. And this even goes for the doctors. When even doctors or private banks are checking my personal information, I can see that from the system. And that is building trust. And that's why today, 98% of our population is also declaring their taxes online because we trust this. We can see what's happening in the background. And this is where you should start with. And then, of course, also when it comes to access, um, then you can't have digital states without giving access to everybody. And by saying access to everybody, I really mean that. First of all, having an internet connection, which we already talked about before, but besides that, also having access to the computers. 
Again, going back to the time of pandemic when most of our kids have to stay at home and also do remote learning and also at the same time parents. If there was five or let's say four or three or four kids in one family, do you think that there are many families who have around five computers at home to everybody who had to attend the classes? No, really. What we started in Estonia, and which I really recommend also to run the initiatives in other countries, was that we had an initiative that computer to every single kid. And families who had more computers that they could use could also lend them for kids who also had to stay from home. And everybody could get connected that way. So really, we need a society that support each other from every single perspective. Not just um, that the government would say that, hey, we will provide all these things, but we have to act as one community. This is how we can achieve great things in life. And, and then uh, coverage we already talked about, and then educational side too. Um, we can talk about education in both uh, ways. First of all, we need to provide professional education to all of the people that work in local governments because they were used to do things on paper before. So they needed a proper education to also understand how things work and how they could support their citizens when they want to use the services. Because pretty much what we did in early, uh, like, I mean, late uh, 1990s and, and early 2000 was that we had just basically replaced these physical offices with computers. There was only one single person who was in the very beginning helping our people, uh, like how to use the services, but, but not having any kind of physical place anymore where people could just wait and accuse there. And, uh, and then, of course, also we need to have a very well-functioning functioning, uh, ecosystem, whatever services we're talking about, because, again, once a person has a bad experience using governmental services, they never go back. You have to provide the best customer experience to your citizens so they really enjoy this entire process and so that they can get everything done very, very fast and also much cheaper. Just to give you an example, if you de declare the taxes online today in Estonia, um, then it takes you maximum one minute and you have your tax return on your account already in two weeks time. If you decide that you want to see a human being and you just go tax and custom board office, waste your time to commute from there and wait there in a queue, maybe if there is somebody else too, it, can, it is going to take you around five weeks to get your um, return. Five to seven weeks, that's what we say usually. Let's think about that for a second. Do you have, want to have your money very fast, things fu functioning fast, or wait forever? I would always choose the best one, like the best in the first one here. Okay, I click again. And then, of course, we talked about briefly the safety of the infrastructure too. And, and we have built an infrastructure that really helps our people to sleep uh, peacefully at night and knowing that their information is safe and sound. And that's why we needed to have a national electronic identity card today. Of course, we're not uh, stuck only on the physical card, but we can do everything on our phone, smart ID, mobile ID, uh, and which, is, which are important. And I was very glad a couple of weeks ago, I met one of your ministers in Estonia. He was at the Italian Digital Summit. We had this discussion because as I understood, Slovenia is also currently implementing this plan to uh, start uh, building a uh, solution very similar to Smart ID. Um, so congratulations and hopefully this will work out. <laughs> uh, so, so this is definitely a solution that is the most well used one uh, by our citizens. Uh, and this of course provides you ways to remotely verif uh, verify yourself when you use services and provide of course also signatures that save time and money. And uh, when we talk about also like designing the services that are based online, then we have done that in a way that it always has to be short and simple. When it comes to our private sector services, Facebook, LinkedIn, so on, they can be fancy. That's okay. Uh, but if it comes to governmental services, they are going to be used by so many different age groups. Uh, maybe my grandmother, 85, and then maybe my, my friend who is 16. Their literacy in digitalization is different. So let's try to keep online services very short and simple so that everybody will know how to use these services. And then I mentioned that already before, try to keep things very citizen-centric, walk through this entire process with our very useful citizens, again, with different background and see how much do they like that as feedback to really serve the best, best uh, experience that side. 
and I also um, wanted to talk about what are our current ongoing uh, projects and future plans for the government. And we are currently also developing proactive services. Um, and I can give you one of the examples where we again want to take steps away from the citizens and provide things proactively for people. Today, if a baby has been born in Estonia, then automatically the doctor will register the baby's birth, parents officially become parents, and then the system automatically sends uh, like the new parents a message, even in the middle of the night if that happens sometimes, um, a message saying congratulations on your newborn baby. Now, we would like to kindly ask you which one of the parents is going to stay at home with a kid because we have a choice either if it's a man or a female. And, and you decide which one of them and then you provide your IBAN number, so your bank account number. And then automatically the system will start sending you the money without you having to ask for that. Besides that, without having to go anywhere, you can again give a bird somewhere <laughs> in a very small area and then you can put your child a name online without having to go anywhere. And the coolest thing about that too, what uh, like happens after is that we also ask a question that in six or seven years of time, your child has to go to school. So we would kindly like to ask you based on your home address, which school you wanna reserve your kid a place in next six or seven years of times. And our local governments by collecting this information seven years ahead, can make much smarter decisions by knowing we need this many teachers in this area, or maybe we should close that, close that school and find some other solution. Why do we collect data? It's because we wanna make smarter decisions, not to be here in June and then see that, oh my God, there is so many new kids coming to the school, but we don't have enough teachers. There is nobody coming, everybody have left that school. So we need to make decisions six years ago, not tomorrow. And then, of course, AI will be replacing many uh, services, already 50 of them last year, will continue to do this year. So again, we want to, uh, again, proactively con contact people, provide them services, and AI will help optimization of this process so that our people who work in the government sector wouldn't have to deal with the manual things, but they can create innovation instead. And then, of course, telemedicine, if we talk about, for example, living in smaller towns, there might not be a hospital in every town, uh, but also by the time of pandemic, we started testing the telemedicine system so that you can, of course, have remote meetings with your doctor, discuss with your doctor, and by the telemedicine, you can send them your, uh, I don't know, there is a ways to do, uh, take a blood test at home already if you have any kind of sickness, or again, by your Apple Watch to send your analysis of your uh, heart rate recently, and all these kind of things, or if there is any problems with the skin, then you can send that information. So we can do these things remotely, and I think this is extremely important, and I think this is the direction that we are going to move to also in the future. And, and uh, remote uh, consultation I already uh, covered. And as the very last slide, um, I also just wanted to bring it up. What are the future trends in my opinion? And I would say that we are never going to go back to um, 2019 anymore, to that early 2020. Uh, people's behaviors have changed a lot. There has been a lot of my like friends and family who have moved to, uh, again, some of the small islands, have bought themselves a beautiful house next to the sea and are currently working half of the week there. And then if they have meetings, then taking the tired plane uh, to the capital city, having their meetings and going back again. And I think that's why, again, digital infrastructure is very much needed not in Estonia, but in each of the country that we have people here from today, uh, because again, it has to be secure and very easy to use to everybody. So I think we're going to stick on remote working, um, not fully, obviously, because everybody likes to see each other again, uh, but, but partly we have much more flexibility now after the uh, COVID crisis. And, and also the other thing that we provide is a digital nomad uh, and also like visas for people coming from their countries so that we have a fully uh, very flexible startup ecosystem where people can also run their business uh, fully remotely. And I was in Amsterdam last week and I met also a couple of people from Slovenia and they asked me a question um, like that they have been seeing so many Slovenian companies registering themselves all of a sudden to Estonia. 
and they're like, why? Like, what's happening? How can you attract them? And they said in, in a recent months, there has been more than 100 of them. And I explained the story because we offer an e-residency program to uh, everybody from any country in the world so that they can get access to the card e-residency, apply online, going to the Estonian embassy, pick it up, and then run your business fully remotely by using all of our online services. Um, they can travel wherever they want to. They can do all the reports online. There is no physical visits ever needed. Uh, so this is a solution that most of the business leaders today are using. And that, again, provides even the Slovenian people possibility to live here in Maribor and not having to go and do any reports in Ljubljana <laughs> uh, because they can, they can be, again, um, whatever their heart belongs to anyway. And then, of course, um, I talked about like the supportive ecosystem regarding startup and the channel one. And we also have this kind of governmental institution that are supporting these people when they want to do things remotely. And then and, and again, creating this uh, flexible environment that side as well. So um, maybe as a conclusion, I would say that um, if we want to build a better future together, then I guess nobody wants to argue with me here that our future is digital. <laughs> is already today and um, the sooner you get there the better it is for your economic system um, because people are waiting for uh, much more flexibility and um, chances to make decisions by themselves um, again focus on the innovation and not having to go to a very much of bureaucracy and uh, hustle and that is also one of the reasons why i'm back in estonia today and working for the government because they are providing me this kind of environment that um, lets me to be more free in my choices. And I can tell you that more and more people are eager to get this kind of system. So I really, really suggest to start building that also here in Slovenia. All right, uh, so that was just a very quick overview of what Estonia has been up to and how we attract people to go to smaller towns in this beautiful Hart Lake uh, in Estonia. Um, so if you uh, want to find out about more of this, then of course um, you can stay in touch with me. I will stick around here and uh, yeah, um, come visit us um, in, in Tallinn. Thank you very much. Hvala tudi Anet, ker smo na tesnem s časom, vas prosim na vprašanja pri hranjih za čas kosida. Thank you, Anet. Um, as we are a bit pressed for time, please save them for a bit later. There will be a roundtable discussion, so you will be able to raise the questions. And now, Katarzyna Šimšak, Polanovska, is going to join us now, who is going to present the climate change adaptation in Wroclaw. Uh, yes, I, uh, I tell you a little bit about uh, climate change adaptation in Wrocław, uh, how are we involved and uh, about our progress and ideas. Uh, I had I to choose something because we, we do a lot, but because of the uh, time I will tell you um, about uh, our green and blue uh, actions and measures. Um, Taking that under consideration our climate policy documents, uh, we've got uh, our strategy in perspective of 2030 and now we um, uh, refresh it a little bit in perspective of 2050 because of the uh, climate crisis and uh, because we would like our strategy to be even more um, uh, climate one, uh, we've got, of course, our uh, urban adaptation plan and other documents uh, which uh, consider uh, climate goals. Uh, but thinking about adaptation to climate change and climate change mitigation, we concentrate on greener, greener water, air quality, and of course, uh, green energy. Today, uh, I will tell you about, uh, as I said, uh, green and blue, blue uh, actions. First of all, we pay a lot of attention uh, to protect what we have. So uh, we do our best uh, to protect uh, our greenery uh, areas, especially trees. Uh, that's why Wrocław was the first um, uh, 
city in Poland that implemented standards for tree protection in the investment process. Those uh, standards are in fact uh, kind of cards, uh, picture language for um, technical uh, staff in construction field to understand, to be aware, uh, they are in the zone of tree protection, not to destroy it, to protect it and not to store uh, heavy materials, not to uh, use it for um, parking heavy cars, uh, and also for designers to adjust uh, solutions um, to um, tree uh, infrastructure, because uh, we treat uh, trees in uh, Wrocław as uh, every other uh, infrastructures like uh, lamps, grids and uh, others. So we do our best to, uh, to keep them as long as uh, possible. Uh, the second uh, actions and uh, direction is greenery, greenery creation. And here you can uh, see two examples. Um, on the right is uh, the square in the city center, uh, which was uh, previously uh, uh, parking for cars, in fact, for uh, municipal officers. And we um, create our, uh, created a beautiful uh, green um, square uh, to have a rest, to uh, uh, reduce uh, heat ion effect and um, to give uh, our residents uh, the place to meet, to um, spend time with family and friends. On the left, you can observe another uh, example of a uh, green area. Previously, it was an industrial one, and after a while, we um, uh, allowed people to, to use it as a uh, recreation um, uh, area, uh, just uh, implementing uh, some paths and uh, small infra infrastructure like uh, um, uh, park ventures to, to spend time uh, there. In fact, we have a goal to um, create green, green areas in, um, in the distance of 300 meters from the uh, place where our residents live to give them uh, give them a possibility to have uh, as much greenery in surroundings as possible. Uh, we um, pay attention and uh, support uh, our residents in uh, their bottom-up actions. Uh, in Wrocław, we, we have participatory budgets. Uh, we, um, we've been um, continuing this uh, project uh, for uh, seven years. And um, the most uh, frequent uh, projects that are, uh, that are requested by our residents are uh, green ones. In fact, not only the parks, pocket parks, but all, also the infrastructure for pedestrian and the cyclists. And here you can uh, see the, the examples of them. Uh, some of them are bigger, some sm smaller, sometimes the that are projects a kind of the pavement wants to create uh, even the place for a single tree or a green area uh, uh, in surrounding of um, uh, buildings or um, uh, roads. Uh, we also create uh, parks for our uh, uh, newborn uh, residents and uh, every year, twice a year, uh, the parents uh, can plant uh, the trees for their children. Uh, they do it by the themselves and then they can take care of the certain tree for their ch ch child or children. Uh, that way, we um, um, we create the awareness of how the uh, the trees and the greenery is important, and that we we have to take care of it in Wrocław. 
We, of course, de develop uh, the new parks, but uh, not only on our um, property, but we also um, uh, gain or buy new lands from uh, another owners. And here is the, the example of new park for which we gain the, um, uh, the, uh, the plot from, um, from uh, military uh, agency. And another example is uh, the park that we are going to create on rail, 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 railway uh, property agency so that uh, you can see that we not only invest on our um, plots, on, on our property, but also try to gain new uh, new um, plots to create green areas for our residents. Here, here you can observe um, uh, the example of green and blue infrastructure. Uh, Grow Green is the project that we realize um, thanks to Horizon 2020, uh, in which we create a system of pocket parks in the courtyards uh, in the city center. Uh, city center is very densify um, space where we have uh, the concentration of uh, uh, of uh, buildings, the concentration of uh, coal stoves. That's why we need as much uh, as possible greenery to improve the um, climate condition, uh, conditions and to improve uh, the quality of life for our residents. Uh, in the, those courtyards, uh, we had a problem with um, rainwater management. Thanks to implementing uh, greenery, we collect the rainwater and we didn't have to invest uh, so much uh, in uh, rainwater uh, infrastructure. Um, the traditional one. Uh, we also test those, those uh, this kind of solutions and our ambition was to uh, create uh, cheap and uh, easy um, implement, implementing uh, solutions. That's why uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, did it in the city center. Uh, another um, example of this project was um, uh, planting the trees uh, along the streets where the trees has never never been before. Uh, we planted them on the under, underground infrastructure, underground grids, and it was the great. Uh, example of cooperation between between municipality and uh, the owners of uh, those uh, underground infrastructure we have a kind of deal uh, in case of any breakdowns uh, they can remove the trees uh, to um, uh, to um, do what they have to with their infrastructure uh, thanks to that uh, we reduced the um, effect of uh, heat island, and now we implement that kind of sol solutions in uh, other uh, streets. Of course, we had a lot of conflict. What should be the first, the place for uh, parking cars or the place for the trees? Uh, this is al always uh, problematical in the city center, so we have to tackle this uh, challenge. Um, example are schools and tree schools. Uh, schools and tree schools uh, can apply for uh, money. Um, example uh, to adjust the surroundings of uh, their buildings, their um, uh, of, the, of the schools to uh, to the climate change and to uh, change them from gray uh, um, from gray surroundings to, to to green one. Thanks to them, uh, children can spend time in. Uh, in the areas uh, that uh, you can see in the picture. Uh, every year we, are, we, we realize from 10 to 20 projects in our uh, schools. Another 
one, uh, another program, city program is Catch the Rain. We encourage uh, our residents to collect rainwater, to reuse it for um, watering their green areas. We started from ourselves. Uh, so uh, in the picture on the left, you can, you can see uh, our municipal building uh, when we collect water to water this, um, uh, this uh, green square. But at the same, uh, infrastructure our residents can create in um, their houses uh, thanks to the uh, money from the city grants from the uh, city. We also encourage uh, our residents to uh, to uh, plant uh, uh, vegetables, herbs, uh, uh, to shorten the chain from uh, farm to fork. Uh, thanks to Food Shift uh, project uh, from Horizon 2030, we created vegetable and herbs um, gardens in uh, schools and preschools, but we also um, implement social gardens in our city and uh, in uh, um, uh, in our streets, we uh, we plant also uh, vegetables, herbs for our residents to um, to take advantage of them, but also to show them that uh, we can uh, we can uh, plant them uh, everywhere where we want. In fact, in in the space of the um, of the city. Uh, let me tell a few words about uh, green energy. Um, uh, this is a challenge for Wrocław. I would say we are uh, quite at the beginning of our uh, of our way, but we we give the tools, we create programs and incentives for our residents. First of all, we uh, we created the map of solar potential for our residents. So every uh, habitant can check whether the roof of uh, his or her uh, house or block of flats uh, has a high potential to install photovoltaic system. Uh, we also um, give uh, the chance not to pay the, uh, the uh, property tax mm -hmm. uh, for those uh, residents and also for the companies who install uh, renewable energy or, uh, on uh, the buildings. And within the period of five years, uh, um, uh, the owner, uh, doesn't have to pay this property uh, tax. We also uh, install uh, the renewable energy on our uh, municipal and public buildings. So this is uh, our challenge, of course. Um, we are before the energetic transformation in Poland, but Wrocław has ambition to, um, to be as uh, a green energy uh, city as possible, so we do our best to improve uh, those actions. Thank you very much. Hvala tudi Katarzyni. Tako zdaj pa je pred nami še sklepni del dogodka, okrogla miza. Thank you, Katarina. And now... A roundtable discussion is ahead of us as the last part of today's conference, and I would like to give the floor to Marco Peterlin, the director of the Institute for Spatial Policies, to moderate the roundtable discussion. The roundtable will take place in English, so we are now going to switch to English, and I would like to ask all my guests to join me at the panel. The guests of round table to join me here uh, on the uh, front of the panel. Uh, our uh, guests uh, are um, Blanca Bartol from the Ministry of Environment and Spatial Planning uh, from Slovenia, uh, Viktor Zitarowski from ESPON, uh, the director of the ESPON EGTC, uh, Annette Numa from the e Estonia Briefing Center, um, Oliver Horeni from uh, Upper Elbe Transport Association. Uh, and uh, Igor Kos uh, from Recycle Institute or now from the Regional Development Agency here in Maribor. Uh, on Zoom will be with us also uh, 
uh, Marek Teplanski uh, from the European Commission, uh, from the uh, unit for uh, urban and territorial matters. Um, regional, sorry, yeah, urban and regional matters. Um, so uh, do we have uh, Marek with us also? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so the aim of the roundtable now is to um, is twofold. First, to discuss the role of different stakeholders in the implementation of the territorial agenda 2030, and second, uh, to discuss how different stakeholders uh, can contribute to territorial quality of life. Um, so. Um, First, I will ask uh, my guests or our guests uh, uh, a question about uh, the role of uh, territorial uh, of stakeholders in implementing territorial cohesion. Um, we can start perhaps with the um, uh, um, guest on the Zoom, uh, Mr. Teplanski from the Euro European Commission. And uh, uh, can we hear each other well? Is it? Uh, can you hear me? I hear you very okay. well. Okay, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the territorial agenda um, was or is member states driven or the pro result of the process of intergovernmental cooperation, but uh, the commission was part of the process all along and is a key player in its implementation. What uh, are the main tasks of, for the Commission in relation to the implementation of Territorial Agenda 2030? And how does your unit work with other parts of the Commission uh, to contribute to implementation of uh, Territorial Agenda? Thank you um, for, for having me. And indeed, uh, as you see, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very well benefiting from the flexibility which was mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in the previous intervention. So I'm, I'm joining you um, from Brussels. Um, and I'm glad that I actually could, have, uh, could join uh, the, the discussion here. Now, as, as you said, I'm coming from the um, Director General for um, Regional and Urban Policy from the unit which is dealing with the inclusive growth, urban and territorial development as a, as a policy unit. And we indeed participated in the, um, 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 in the deliberations, discussions on uh, the preparation of the Territorial Agenda 2030. We are committed partner. We do represent uh, um, our colleagues um, in the numerous uh, uh, services in, uh, in the governance structures. Um, but our role is not limited uh, to, uh, uh, to participating in the meetings um, of, uh, of a Territorial Agenda 2030, I mean, in the governance as such. We have a, a broader role because uh, our policy, and particularly I will be speaking um, on behalf of the cohesion policy, we are uh, very well uh, um, uh, tuned into um, uh, the priorities, and the objectives of the of the territorial agenda. Obviously, not because we were part of the uh, part of the, the the discussions and the and and the group on preparation, but simply because uh, we form along with other policies an EU response actually to the challenges uh, uh, which are there for us, not only for the Commission or the EU institutions, but for the member states and most of all for the local stakeholders in relation to um, uh, green and digital transition in particular. Now, cohesion policy um, obviously is not a, is a, not a new instrument when I, I hope I don't need to explain uh, to participants uh, on, the, on the essentials in there, but I would perhaps concentrate how the 2127 cohesion policy is contributing uh, to the objectives uh, of the territory agenda 2030. And, and there, I would highlight um, um, the contribution to uh, uh, the um, um, imperatives of the transition, particularly as concerns uh, building and creating a, a smarter and more competitive uh, Europe for greener and carbon neutral Europe, uh, more connected Europe, more social Europe, and Europe closer to citizens. These are five headlines or five policy uh, objectives which we will be following uh, in the cohesion policy and where the discussions with the, with the stakeholders on the member states level 
at the national level are taking place already for some time. So we are in the course of preparing um, investment responses to challenges uh, um, uh, which uh, are relating and are exactly the same, are the shared challenges uh, across different uh, governance levels as, as they were pinpointed in the, in the territorial agenda. Now, I would highlight perhaps um, as a matter of contribution, um, uh, a strong concentration, uh, thematic concentration of funding on a, on a smart and competitive and a greener uh, uh, policy objectives, um, which also is showing you know, where the weight of the investments should be. And, and I think that this is very well aligning with the, uh, with the objectives of the, uh, of the territorial agenda. Now, um, we, we do pay uh, 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 very uh, uh, particular attention to uh, stakeholder engagement. And this is another connecting uh, point with the multi-level governance of the territorial agenda. In the investments uh, of the cohesion policy, we are very much uh, favoring, um, first of all, place-based approach, because we believe that the local challenges uh, or the challenges um, have a different territorial display and should be addressed locally. And at the same time, uh, we believe at the broad stakeholder involvement in addressing these challenges. I mean, first of all, designing the response and then also implementing uh, the measures or investments to address, uh, to address these challenges. But at the same time, you know, on the other side, there are also opportunities. Um, and therefore, um, um, you, 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 uh, I'm sure you are aware of the policy objective, which is a territorial policy objective, a Europe closer to citizens, where we put emphasis on, uh, on these two dimensions, place-based approach, holistic response uh, to, uh, to challenges in the given, in the given uh, locality or, or place or territorial uh, unit, and the involvement of the, uh, of the stakeholders uh, who should uh, participate and basically own uh, the, um, uh, the, the design and the response to these, uh, to these uh, uh, local challenges. Now, I, I would not necessarily go uh, perhaps in, in my, uh, my intervention in, in full, full flesh explanations on that. Uh, this is just on, on a very broad, uh, um, um, let's say alignment and orientations, which is, however, the, the cooperation and connecting points are much more granular. Uh, and, I, and I do mention only a few when, when we talk about the, um, the urban rural linkages, the importance of, uh, of cities uh, for, the, uh, for the surrounding areas in relation to the, uh, or in the context of the functional, uh, functional area approach, um, the importance of um, strengthening the innovative potential in, uh, in, in a different, um, um, uh, in different uh, localities or territories, which we had developed and, and, and put forward uh, throughout the past programming period. And I'm sure that many of you are aware of the smart specialization and the entire uh, uh, governance, which is, uh, which is related uh, to that. Um, let me also mention, um, perhaps very briefly, um, besides the mainstream uh, interventions, uh, which concerns the national programs, uh, cohesion policy programs, and uh, regional programs, that we have also territorial cooperation, uh, strand, of, uh, strand of work, where we do uh, uh, indeed support and encourage cooperation across, uh, across different, uh, uh, different territories on, on, on different issues, be it in the strand of the transnational cooperation, inter-regional or cross-border cooperation. I think that that should be also uh, um, uh, perhaps highlighted as it, as it uh, has its place uh, also in the, in the territorial agenda and in, in the ways of, of addressing uh, these, uh, these challenges. Thank I you. would perhaps stop in very, and will, and will be my last one because I'm eating too much time. Okay. I, I hear, is that well, this is a, a, a kind of broad outline of a cohesion policy. But obviously, there are uh, 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 another instruments which are created at the at the EU level, which will be uh, along this way contributing to the territorial agenda. You know, the whole agenda of the Green Deal, Next Generation EU recovery plans, and so on. Are very much uh, um, aligned with the uh, with the priorities as outlined in the territorial agenda. But I will stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Teplansky. Staying in the um, 
cohesion policy. Maybe we can uh, start now with uh, Viktor Sidorowski from the ESPON EGTC. So ESPON program is part of cohesion policy somehow. And uh, how does ESPON su support implementation of territorial agenda? Or more precisely, which role of ESPON has the most, most impact for specific policy levels, perhaps? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, we have drawn a strong alliance with the territorial agenda because the word territorial is the, the key to, to all actions that we perform as ESPOM. Um, so uh, we are going hand in hand in implementing the, the pilot actions and we feel that what we could be better at as ESPOM program is to reach out to local and regional stakeholders. And I think this is the, uh, the certain challenge that also the territory agenda has. Both the SPON program and the, uh, the territory agenda 2030 could be regarded as a somewhat hermetic initiatives, steered top down by the national ministries in the commission. Of course, all conspiracy excluded Marek from that. Mm -hmm. But uh, to let the people understand what territoriality means, what place-based approach means, what citizen-centric approach means, we need to be more, much more better in communicating the priorities and the uh, quite high aspirations mm -hmm. behind the territory agenda. So this is where we are looking at, that the pilot actions should be started actually on the ground, under the auspices of the territory agenda. Whenever possible, we are able also to support them as ESPON program by presenting the good solutions, the case studies, the targeted analysis, some European-wide projects that bring certain inspiration for action. But we need to be really, really effective in launching these initiatives that they, they were recognized on the ground. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, also for being brief, <laughs> which is uh, our, uh, as we're a bit late, yes, this is very important. Uh, maybe because you mentioned the importance of regional and local actors, now we can uh, ask maybe Mr. Horeni, who comes from uh, this regional level um, and who was very reluctant to join the roundtable, I have to say, because uh, especially because of the, the uh, um, relation to the territorial agenda. And, uh, um, and I would like to ask you, are you aware you are actually contributing to an important aspect of territorial cohesion policy when you were uh, implementing the, the cross-border ticket system? And, and um, yeah, maybe... To continue on that. Yeah, the bad news is no. <laughs> as as an employee on the professional plan planning level, I was not aware of this uh, agenda. The good news is, when I dealt with the agenda in preparation for this meeting, I um, had to see that the targets and the, the goals uh, the agenda has are actually already the goals we as transport planners have. So it must be inherent to the genes of a public transport planner mm -hmm. um, already, because we uh, strive to connect people, connect regions, networking. Um, we uh, want to encourage sustainable behavior. We uh, want to um, build bridges between the people uh, also between people with different incomes, so it should be affordable to everyone. So even though I, we are not aware, I, I can speak for my colleagues as well, even though that we are not aware of this uh, transport agenda, I think our work has always been in line with uh, the targets and the aims. Yeah, it's also probably related to the general aims of the um, national and European policies somehow, but not in a direct way that you would um, uh, connect to somehow, perhaps. Um, um, maybe staying on this level, because I'm pretty sure that many of the regional and local actors are not really aware of uh, territorial agenda as, as, as such. And, and uh, I can address now uh, Igor Kost from uh, Maribor. Um, so um, uh, what were your, uh, what was your relation to territorial agenda and what will be, how it will change when you uh, now um, raise your efforts to, um, from local to regional level, uh, be becoming part of the regional development agency now and uh, 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 
how does this affect uh, your efforts? Well, well, circular economy as such uh, is local, is regional, because uh, as it was mentioned before, functional urban area means that things are functioning inside this area in general. Uh, so even with uh, this uh, integrated sustainable urban development strategy that was, the, that was developed, we knew uh, because of the analysis how many people from the outside of municipalities coming daily to work in, in municipality, how many students are coming because of education, because of health services, because of culture and uh, other services that urban centers are providing. But through that, they are also creating these streams of mat materials. And we were basically looking from the start and the beginning of our work uh, regionally. Uh, for example, in Urban Innovative Action Project, uh, Urban Soul for Food, we had partner from Ptui, which is 25 kilometers from Maribor. Uh, and they did quite well uh, on the social innovation part uh, of the project. Uh, so we are looking forward to this opportunity uh, that we will have reach of 41 municipalities instead of just one uh, uh, officially. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are quite aware of the challenges uh, of uh, different size of municipalities that are in this uh, Podravska region where, where we are now uh, having this conference. Um, but uh, challenges are there to be accepted and uh, worked on. So we are looking mm -hmm. forward to this opportunity. And uh, I think circular economies with its base principles uh, will serve well uh, and be well developed uh, from the city of Maribor into the region. But to uh, let's say um, uh, get back to the um, issue before, were you aware of the territorial agenda enough? I know you're yes. part of the European uh, urban development policy and not so much the territorial policy. Yes, through development of the integrated sustainable urban development strategy, we were aware of uh, all this uh, momentum and uh, all these policies. Uh, we were quite fortunate to have good. Uh, working relations also with the urban program and other programs that are uh, in place um, what was important that we quite early in the process learned that not every project is suitable for every call uh, so we also targeted certain calls with certain projects uh, and this is also uh, based on the knowledge that we gained from all these policies mm -hmm. um, we participated in uh, several cities forums the last one in porto unfortunately the last one was uh, in january 2020 just before things changed uh, uh, but it, it is this exchange and also international exchange that helps us uh, with our development here and will also help us in future Thank you. Now, going back to the national level and first addressing uh, um, Blanca Bartol, um, Igor mentioned the collaboration with the ministry before, and uh, uh, I wonder how does your ministry engage in, with other sectors also, not, um, beyond the environment and spatial planning, in order to promote their ter territorial agenda and its implementation? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you again. So, um, hello to everybody. Um, I shall say that um, within our responsibility, as you mentioned, uh, spatial development, spatial planning and housing and many others, we uh, have to interact with other sectors, of course. Uh, and our uh, aim is to, or a goal or um, task is to translate territorial agenda in our spatial development strategy. And with doing, uh, by doing this, um, we, of course, um, um, have uh, many meetings because we, we were in the preparation of the, our national or renewal, uh, re renewal of our um, spatial development strategy. And we wanted from the very beginning um, attract um, sectors. I mean, this is something we have been done uh, many times, uh, I mean, in the past also, but it's still uh, not something that we say that the, the, the uh, that this is a final stage that we are all very well integrated. This is a work that has to be constantly done with the sectors. Uh, uh, also to um, in this horizontal uh, at this horizontal level um, we need to to understand from each other uh, co uh, collaboration with it, with each other that sectors measures sectoral measures are very important for 
achieving um, each other objectives. For example, if I may, uh, may uh, say that uh, a measure from one sector can support uh, uh, achieving uh, objectives of the other. So this integration is uh, somehow natural, but is usually uh, not performed very well. So we see our task um, is to, to bring sectors together, also to understand how they can build synergies uh, in the territories and also understand that territories are very diverse and that uh, their measures might have to be adapted to the diversity and to the needs that those territories and of course the population living there have. So um, this was our main, I would say, <laughs> um, um, aspects trying to also uh, translate in, uh, when translating this territoriality, territoriality and uh, objectives of territorial agenda into our national framework. And the other is also, uh, because this also helps very much to achieve um, um, the objectives of quality of life, which we are strongly um, advocating for in our, uh, this new document, uh, something similar what uh, Annette said, uh, building uh, or um, helping people to, to have a quality of life um, in the places where they live. Uh, so it, it could be urban or rural, I mean, or remote or mountainous. Uh, so, um, and understanding the role also of small and medium-sized cities in this respect, um, when we are talking of, for example, rural areas and bringing services and other aspects to them. And here, of course, uh, sector roles are very important mm -hmm. to understand also these relations to the territories. Thank you very much. And now to Annette, last but not, not least in this round, uh, you are coming from a non-territorial sector, so to say, uh, digitalization. And uh, have you considered when, the, let's say, developing the solutions uh, in, in your uh, sector, uh, the implications for the territorial development uh, uh, when you like, uh, uh, were thinking and uh, um, uh, forwarding the, the processes? Uh, well, first of all, um, of course, like when we think about Estonia as the size and the population, um, we only have 1.3 million people, which is two times less than here. But by the distant side, uh, we are much larger when we co compare that also to Slovenia, which means that people are anyway living in all around the state, not only stuck in a capital city. So since very early days already, as I developed before, um, we wanted to get rid of bureaucracy. And again, that was mm -hmm. the aim already since very early days. Uh, the goal of getting rid of the physical, like the offices, which is part of this kind of uh, also plan as well. Uh, but uh, so, so, so definitely I, I would consider this also as, as one of the main strategies already in the beginning, uh, because that was a pain point and we wanted to kind of like change that pain point. But uh, I, I just wanted to bring it out and, and comment because uh, previously somebody was also asking like, how can we, there was this survey on the screen here, like how can we get uh, closer to the people and provide them better quality of life? And I would say the only way to do that is to really talk to people, but of course using the online channels. And, and one of the methods for that is that we are using a lot of e-democracy systems, especially in a smaller towns. So if there is like a local government, a local community side there, then whenever they have the budget, they, they uh, take some amount, some amount of money from the budget and they are just asking a question from the citizens. There isn't like an online platform that you can choose topics that you want this money to be spent on. So you can select them one by one, which is number one priority and so on, so on. Do you want to have a playground or maybe instead of that, you want to have a new library. Um, so this, this is also like providing like life quality, I would say. And, and this is why I recommend to really talk to people. And, and if you can do that in a way so that they don't have to come for, again, another uh, polling station in a way to, to write their things on paper, which is annoying, but you really want them to create their future, then you can use these methods to, uh, to hear their opinion. And this is what we are really trying to do since early days already, like to provide this kind of e-democracy for them uh, so that they can, they can really design their future, not us. 
Thank you very much. Thank you also for introducing the second round of questions actually related to uh, quality of life. And I would start now with uh, Viktor Shidarowski from ESPON because uh, it was the, the topic that he introduced in this uh, uh, um, uh, event, this conference. Uh, and um, I would like to ask you, how do you hope would this, uh, let's say, process that you started and the uh, 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 territorial quality of life and the policy brief itself that you are preparing maybe, um, how did it inform policies at different levels and how, which were the, let's say, most important changes that it will drive uh, at the different levels? That's a very, very difficult question you are posing about the changes. Uh, we have our hopes and dreams about the changes that we could uh, instill in the uh, decision-making frame. But we are just a humble messenger of the changes that are needed, and it's the member states, the regions, the local authorities, and the people, the citizens, that need to induce these changes in, in the entire framework. So, uh, we are here to connect, and I think to connect has been the, the word that has been used in, in many different uh, contexts and connotations, connecting electronically, connecting physically like we are doing mm -hmm. today, also connecting in terms of the knowledge transfer, mm -hmm. because we have a lot to offer as ESPON. Also, territorial agenda should be inspirational enough for the people mm -hmm. to understand it's not yet another enforcement of any law or legislation by the uh, member states or the commission, it's the certain facilitation process mm -hmm. so that the decision makers should understand on what the place-based policies are about, customized, tailor-made, you name it. So the change is that I would aspire to see is that the decision makers understand the territorial context of what they are doing, mm -hmm. that no one size fits all is actually the way to go, but that in order to come up with right and smart decisions, people need to understand what's going on in my territory, mm. what's going to happen if I do this, what's going then to be a, a sort of impossible interrelation between my area and the neighboring areas, because mm. it's important. The functional areas, we are not living in a separate isolated silos, we have some neighbors. So we need to analyze and understand the broader geographical setting. And this is mm. what we hope we are able to illuminate and inspire through ESPON, mm. through territory agenda, the people, the decision makers to understand, comprehend, and apply in practice. Mm. So changes through um, the understanding the context. The mindset. Yeah, yes. the mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know uh, who would be the next uh, uh, good speaker, but I think it would be nice to go from top down now, maybe again from the EU level. Uh, and uh, um, Mr. Teplansky, um, I would address you now um, with the question, uh, which are um, specific policies uh, or programs or even projects uh, that your unit uh, uh, uses or could use for in, in Improving territorial quality of life, but um, maybe in a sense that um, uh, how does it um, relate to uh, also to other levels of, um, uh, um, let's say, directly to the national level or directly to the regional or uh, local level? Which would be the main tools that you would use, you could use for this? Um. Thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, we are going bottom up right? because I see myself uh, on the top of uh, up top of the screen. So that's by definition the way I'm placed there. Um, <laughs> okay, not necessarily in in a, in a hierarchical uh, uh, structure. Uh, yes, I I would say um, and and I would here maybe join uh, uh, Victor on 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 his line. What we do uh, with the cohesion policy. Um, um, and particularly with the, uh, with the strand of work uh, my unit is responsible for, we are not prescribing uh, solutions. We, we provide for a toolbox which can be used um, um, to address um, particular situations. And we very much encourage uh, uh, the member states uh, to embark on, uh, on, on, this, uh, on this road, uh, engage uh, regions, engage local stakeholders, open uh, dialogues, have a um, applying co-creation uh, to, uh, to strategies and investment responses 
at the, at the different localities. This is what is policy objective five uh, about, but it doesn't end only there. Uh, it, um, um, it's, a, it's a bit broader, um, let's say, undertaking we, we, we have here because we are connecting also with the colleagues uh, in other DGs who, have responsible, or who are responsible for um, uh, initiatives which are addressing uh, territorial um, um, or are translating into territorial uh, dimension um, of well, which something which seemingly could be a, a sectoral uh, sectoral approach, um, and particularly in in in, in my unit, um, we um, um, we do work on uh, on on a particular strand of uh, urban innovation, and I, I think it was uh, indeed mentioned uh, as the urban innovative actions projects. Uh, where uh, we are um, um, responsible for the uh, for the instrument uh, for the um, 86 projects uh, which uh, which we had financed uh, in the 2014-20 programming period, but we are expanding and 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 emphasize and, and and enlarging the offer um, um, indeed uh, for the 21-27 programming period for the European Urban Initiative, where again. Uh, Providing for solutions uh, for the for the cities, uh, the stakeholders, um, um, capacity building, networking, capitalization of knowledge. I think these were all important elements which were mentioned uh, in the previous uh, interventions, and I think that's the, the open communication and the channels and sharing. I think it's uh, it's it's a key here. So we are working on 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 this particular uh, particular strand. Uh, we are in very close uh, contacts uh, uh, and uh, discussions with uh, with Espon on on on, on preparing and, and finalizing the program uh, for 2127, obviously. Um, uh, and I would mention also Urbact, uh, where we are also my unit is responsible uh, for liaison with the um, and, and management, at least on the level of the Commission uh, for the for the Urbact program uh, Urbact program as such. Um, I think that what is, uh, what is key here is uh, to see to what extent um, actually the tools which are out there and which are offered well in the cohesion policy but also beyond are, are properly, properly used, uh, uh, deployed and, um, um, and, uh, and, and on the way combined uh, to provide for the responses of uh, and, and the needs of uh, of different stakeholders, and I think that um, uh, that's also a part of or one dimension of the work under the um, the territorial agenda in in terms of the outreach and providing for inspiration examples and and solutions uh, to these challenges uh, is, uh, is 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 part of the the work which uh, I think is particularly valuable. And I'm, I'm looking forward to see also uh, the, the practical translations from the pilots, pilot actions, which are, which are currently being, uh, being put in place. Um, so I, I would perhaps stop here. I mean, we have obviously, and we will continue working uh, with, the, with, the, with the colleagues uh, and the, um, in, in the multi-level governance setting uh, for the territorial agenda. Um, I, I would just conclude with the fact that well, what is important is, is the um, uh, cooperation and, and synergetic effects of all levels. I mean, it can't be um, solved uh, only by one level. And I think that the key is to find a good way uh, of cooperating and combining actually uh, resources and, uh, and strength to achieve the, uh, the objectives of territorial agenda. Thank you very much. So to, to maybe to sum up that the territorial agenda can uh, be a, a tool to or a, a framework which uh, helps the tools that you offer all different levels uh, uh, in let's say achieving uh, uh, quality of life or territorial quality of life somehow so it can be a good uh, let's say uh, um, benchmark or uh, uh, um, checklist for <laughs> helping these uh, tools use efficiently. Um, Blanca, I, I might uh, address you now uh, um, as a, like one level down <laughs> from the EU level. Um, so um, which programs or policies that your ministry implements, maybe also in relation to the EU, uh, using EU tools, uh, um, by your, your opinion, contributes, co contribute most to quality of life or um, at which level maybe? 
okay. very abstract sorry <laughs> but this is all very abstract so yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, I will mention. I, I would like to mention also again the strategy. I mean, we have the uh, we have a quality of life as a, um, a vision in our development strategy already, but it's too general. I mean, to our understanding. So we hopefully um, uh, um, do, did it um, in a way, right way to add this territorial dimension in our uh, spatial development strategy. But this is of course not not final. I mean, we we need to of course, um, uh, make uh, uh, also a vertical um, and to see how the how this quality of life can be really implemented and what really it, it, it means for the people on the ground. So there are also uh, regional spatial development, I mean, regional spatial plans, sorry, uh, operational programs, um, or, or, I mean, the programs, development programs of the regions that can make this uh, uh, becoming um, more tangible and also uh, what we are talking or what we are doing now today the eu programs that uh, through them the municipalities and other actors can um, can um, can do specific projects um, that can tackle this issue i mean various strands of the quality of life which are we know very um, uh, composed of very many uh, um, areas that can be uh, all together give a certain um, quality to certain places. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very much um, inspired. I was very much inspired with the cases we have here. And I think that maybe in the future, this should be more promoted. Mm -hmm. I mean, the use of how people are dealing with this because all, all the project we, we, that were presented here um, in, tackles the quality of life in a way uh, or one or another way uh, but of course um, the, the this has to be um, um, also has to be shown to the people mm -hmm. that can understand and can also uh, say a word whether this is also for them or, or not in the in the in the areas on the urban or small places or big urban areas, so we can develop together with the policy makers at different mm -hmm. levels, uh, proper um, programs. And yeah. I was thinking plans. to be more precise, maybe what about the, what's the relation of or the role of uh, local special plans in this, uh, and how, how can ministry actually um, influence them? Or I mean, ministry has um, by its legis legislative um, power or I mean the decisions or the, the, the um, solutions given there um, of course the power to over, over to look um, to to see whether the plans are reconciled with the spatial uh, strategic spatial um, guidelines guidelines but I mean quality of life is something that could be <laughs> difficult to mm -hmm. um, to be to be you know judged from this aspect but nevertheless of course we have uh, we have a polycentric urban system we have um, um, certain objectives in terms of uh, how to improve the quality of life in urban areas in cities but also in rural mm -hmm. areas which can ha which have a certain um, um, aspects that has to be followed or certain uh, rules or um, principles uh, but also certain indicators that we are going to 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 to, to see uh, how uh, the policy um, is being implemented um, but um, I'm 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 sorry to say that you know, too often we are we are too much uh, too much um, into a sector of planning, uh, which brings not very much integrated approach. But they are looking for their sectoral objectives, which might not be, um, I mean, the real need of the people. Mm -hmm. So that's also one thing we need to to go further uh, in um, trying to to improve mm -hmm. um, the understanding how sectors can bring quality of life. Um, to people uh, through what actions mm -hmm. uh, um, and um, so thanks um, Annette uh, now to you um, you have mentioned several aspects of let's say quality of life in your presentation actually but there was one that is actually showing in the in the questions that I will 
now uh, use. Uh, so how does uh, how do you uh, relate to the services that cannot be digitalized, like um, uh, um, grocery stores or uh, I don't know post offices? How does this digitalization strategy help with this? Actually, does can it uh, contribute also? in this sense to the quality of life that it makes some um, access to some services easier for, I don't know, other reasons. For, yeah. Well, grocery store, it is linked to digitalization already for yeah. a long time. Uh, I have my grandfather living very far from where my parents live, which is around one and a half hours drive. And they do not have, as they have also very busy life to have time to go there and bring my uh, grandfather food. Um, there is an internet service, you pay four euros for transportation and my mom is doing all the grocery shopping and then this is going to be delivered the next day to my grandfather's store. Mm -hmm. This is working. Uh, this is working for a long time already and then everybody used that then again, especially time of pandemic and imagine how much money we would spend off driving this one and a half hour on our petrol. So, so this is very affordable to everybody. So I would I wouldn't say that this is this is not. This working. is a good example. Maybe it's a bad one. Okay. Um, well, postal office. Uh, well, less and less people use that, obviously. But we do have uh, delivery robots. Uh, that are, there is random places, these kind of delivery boxes that uh, the robots are delivering stuff there. You can take it from there. There is nobody. So most of the people use that, especially in a smaller towns where there is no bigger postal offices. So this is kind of covered too. <laughs> okay. So, so there, there is not many things that you still need to show up uh, in, in person. Uh, and um, well, we were talking about the quality of life here and I just uh, wanted to make a little a very, very short remark on that. Uh, I, I just came from Dubai yesterday and uh, I had some work meetings there too. And do you know that in Dubai, I mean, in UAE, in Emirates, there is even a special ministry, which is called uh, Citizens Happiness Center. Mm -hmm. So they even have a different mm -hmm. ministry, not even like, like different ministers working on that aspect, but they have a special ministry that is dealing with a citizen's happiness. And I think we all need that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will also now be a bit, um, maybe to, to, I think, build on the idea of the question that, that has um, uh, um, come. Uh, maybe, is there a way that digitalization can worsen the quality of life, maybe? Because you, people sometimes like to be together. Mm -hmm. can, and maybe sometimes they, they just like to queue in a line for something because of socializing, especially older people. Is this a, an yeah. aspect in your consideration? Well, true. Our elderly people are lonely. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've been asking really like, let's do some research. Who are the people who still show up? I, I, I'm not saying that there is no of, like um, offices anymore in Estonia. There is. If you want to go and declare your taxes, not on paper, but with the help of another person, you have this chance, but there is just very few of them. Um, and, and sometimes there are queues. Their office is actually um, around 20, 30 meters from where I work. And, and sometimes in the morning there's a queue. And I've been thinking, why are these people there? And they have done some research and, and one of the main reasons is uh, that elderly people feel lonely. And the biggest highlight of their day is to go and talk to somebody. And this is their only chance because maybe their, their families live very far away. So obviously this is, we become maybe more lonely if we have all these methods that we can be on the phone all the time and get everything done very smoothly. But that's why we need friends and just the other activities. And then and that, that's where we should move to in a way. But, uh, but, but definitely, uh, I mean, this might have like an impact. And when I was talking about the eye voting, uh, also when we think about that, okay, half of the population is using this, but half of them may, are not. What's the reason? Why they, do they still go to polling stations if that's so easy? Um, same reasons. It has traditions and, and you want to like, because elections are pretty special. So you want to show up there, see that I care about this, maybe take your kids with you and show that if you make a decision, you design your future. Well, there are many reasons which we could continue discussing for hours, mm. but, but definitely, um, yeah, let's not get too lonely because of digitalization. Okay, yeah. So yeah, if you have the option, then you can choose basically, first of all. Yeah, Victor. Yeah, you yeah just immediate comment because uh, listening to Annette, sometimes we feel we live in a different planet. <laughs> about this, you know, friendly government, friendly administrative framework. And I think what you said in your presentation, building trust. 
when we don't have the trust, mutual trust between the citizen, the group of citizens and the administration, we'll never achieve any good measures about the quality of life. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the very basics mm -hmm. that we need to start. The Nordic countries and Estonia have been successful mm -hmm. in bringing the high confidence in administration between or among the citizens. In many other countries, there is quite low level of confidence. Mm. And then it's extremely difficult to ask people to open up, to talk to the government, to the authorities about the quality of life, because they distrust the government and the authorities. So this is a very basic primary thing that mm -hmm. the government and the administrations need to do in many of the countries concerned. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Mr. Horeni, um, to you. Uh, you have developed a service or improved the service actually kind of which is uh, um, helping also in uh, some simplifying travel for many people and connecting and uh, what do you see as, as let's say the main um, if effects or main contributions to of your uh, ticket system to, to quality of life in a way in the in the cross-border area uh, that you are work, working on. Mm -hmm. When I think about quality of life, I, I had to think back to the days nine years ago, I think almost when I applied for the job I do have now. And during the interview, I was asked what means public transport to you? And I literally said, it means quality of life. <laughs> so it's uh, funny now that I get this question from a different perspective. <laughs> Um, yeah, to answer your question from a more um, professional perspective, I, I see the public transport sector as um, in a key role, as an enabler for, for uh, quality of life and also for cohesion. Because in the case of this cross-border ticket system, we make the infrastructure on the other side of the border accessible for the people who live there. So we open up their, their circle of action, in fact. On the other side, um, public transport is not only a means of transport, it's also a place where people meet. So they come together and um, discover together the infrastructure and the nature and the recreational areas of this region. And this way, I think they um, can develop this feeling of identity mm -hmm. that they are connected to the region. And um, yeah, so maybe in densely populated areas like um, Saxony, it, it works, but it might not work everywhere. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, Annette. Yeah. Can I just add on that? Because I also think like Germany is actually a very good example. You're from Germany, right? We discussed. Um, so, um, I mean, it's a very good example, actually, how transportation really makes people, again, more flexible to live in different places. Because when you think about the speed trains in Germany, I mean, it's, you, can, you can work there too. You can use your time. And, and that's why we need this infrastructure also in all the other countries. Because, I mean, I mean, if you can go from one city to another, which is like, I don't know, 500 kilometers away, which is one and a half or two hours in a way, because there is a good speed train or the same goes in France, Paris and Lyon, like you would always go, like it's, it's, it's fine because uh, I myself, I lived in Lyon. So it was just like one hour and uh, like 40 minutes to go to Paris with, with a train where you could, again, still work and do your stuff because you were connected uh, also with a good internet connection and so on. So that's how you can like commute between different cities. And, and I, I guess made the main focus should be also, of course, also on transportation. So that if mm. you have meetings, it's quick process, not a very, uh, again, <laughs> painful process of going from one place to another. Mm. And we need less cars, obviously, too. Yeah, I agree with both of you very much <laughs> about um, uh, public transport and the accessibility or to, to good public transport as a very important aspect of quality of life in general. And I, I was really, when traveling to Maribor from Ljubljana, I was wishing I could use uh, an efficient public transport because it would save me a lot of time <laughs> because I could work on the train and I cannot do it in a car. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, we lack this in Slovenia. Uh, but to go to, the, to Slovenia in the end, uh, um, Igor, um, um, the aspect, how does, how does circular economy 
contribute to uh, quality of life. I was thinking about this question, how, what, uh, what to ask you, and I couldn't imagine a, like a very concrete example. What's the why, why would people live be live better or be better off uh, with circular economy um, in place? Well, for for a start, it's a better system than linear economy. Uh, <laughs> which causes a lot of problems, uh, a lot of pollution, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, even diseases probably uh, with this way we consume materials and goods and everything. So uh, it, it's a base, it's completely different. The principles are, are different. Uh, the way how we operate, if we are following um, the principles of circular economy, uh, just doing the simple things are contributing. So uh, in our case, uh, we test solutions before we start talking about them. So uh, I personally have to go through the process uh, before I start, I would not say preaching, but telling about it. Um, so for example, I don't use black bean uh, anymore because I, when I buy stuff and it doesn't cost me anymore, I already consider what I will do with this. It's just a small fraction in the beginning you have to think about it now it's automatic uh, so i'm not contributing in one of the waste streams okay i still contribute to the others uh, but there are a lot of things that we personally can do right now just changing our habits and following different systemic uh, approach to how we do things for example I, I was fortunate and i was one of the fortunate people here i could walk to this conference today uh, from my home. So it's like good 10 minutes walk and I did walk. I didn't drive. I didn't go with the bicycle. I walked because it's uh, also nice weather uh, com compared to Monday when it was raining all the time. So, <laughs> but these are small decisions. So not to take a car for a, let's say one kilometer uh, distance. It's small decision that actually contributes to your quality of life, but also to other people's quality of life. And there is a lot that we can do. Uh, there is much more than that governments, the government can do on local or on regional. Okay, we don't have exactly governance on a regional level in Slovenia, but on the national level, uh, it's just change few smaller things and we can start all with that and then everything else will follow up. Uh, it's a process. Uh, changing habits is the hardest thing. Uh, maybe colleagues from other, uh, how it was changing habits from the manual to digital, how long it took, maybe Annette can uh, in break or now uh, talk about how long it took. Uh, and here is the same. It will take time. We know all that. It will take time. It's not like a switch for the light. You know, now it's on, now it's off. It's, it doesn't work like that. We all have to see benefits for ourselves and uh, considering the public transport, I wish the same as you. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to go to Ljubljana in 50 minutes uh, with a train. I cannot, I hope in near future that will happen, but now we still drive with the car for hour and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, this is the situation. We all live in it. Uh, we would like to go from Vienna to, to Koper in three hours with the train, which is quite possible. It's a, approximately the same distance as paris Lyon. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, like a technical breakthrough, it's just the willing of the government to actually do something for citizens uh, and improve the uh, situation. Uh, commuting takes a lot of time, which is lost, because you have to pay attention on the road, otherwise you pay attention to something else late, later. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, going by train and be able to work uh, and use this time, even to relax, it's, it's one way uh, mm -hmm. that will again contribute to quality of life of everybody mm -hmm. not to come stressed of the driving after one one and a half hour either to workplace or back home uh, it's not helping quality of life so we can do all a bit more because public transport was one of the topics i jumped mm -hmm. on it but otherwise circular economy is the way forward uh, it's partially up to us so we can do a lot ourselves but as a society we have to do this otherwise as I said a few years ago in Poland at one of the conferences, the other scenario is not the one that, that I want to be in. Mm -hmm. I want to be in that one. And I will so, do everything mm -hmm. what we can and uh, hopefully everybody will join in to kind of go into that scenario, not the other one mm -hmm. where linear economy will lead us. We all know where.
Thank you. So not just that we don't have any option, basically, we have to switch to circular, but it's also that, I mean, even if we don't see the benefits for quality of life, like right ahead, they are around the corner. They are, the, the indirect effects are uh, um, in better uh, living environment, in uh, uh, um, less pollution uh, and so on, and less more resources left for for other. It's up to us. We make decisions every day. When we go to store, we make decisions. When we mm. de decide to leave the car keys on the table and walk, it's our decision. Mm. So it's it's okay. partially up to us, but it's also up to the system to accept these different situations and to allow this change to happen and uh, facilitate this change. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Okay. but we can do a Thank lot you. and we can, we can lead by example, actually. This is the way forward. Thank you. Thanks to all the guests from my side. Uh, I would now open the floor. We are well, well uh, past the, the time that we planned, but we started a bit later. So uh, I would at least, I would take at least two questions. Uh, Still, we have some time, and uh, I would ask now the audience if uh, somebody would like uh, to pose a question to the guests related to the uh, theme of the roundtable or their presentations. We have we have, we have time. Much, yeah. Please come. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Marco. I just have a question. It's on the digitalization. You know, I might be one of those persons who are very much scared of it. You know, and I just don't want actually to live in a digital world. You know, I don't want to see, you know, my kids being on the screen, um, let's say, 18 hours a day. You know, and fighting with them and so on. But one issue that you have raised, actually, it's, it's really very important. Is we have to ask people. We have to ask people what they want. We have to ask people what their values are and what this quality of life means to them. And, and in this sense, yeah, I believe that this also digital technologies might be of a good help you know, to us. But here, what I'm afraid is that, at least I see it like that, that this, um, then the communication, let's say, between the decision maker, policy maker, you know, and the, and the citizen is just, you know, it's, it's, it's a dialogue. But what they actually need to understand what, what the community, you know, what the society means. So we also need to build, let's say, a society. And it's much easier, I believe, uh, achievable if actually we don't talk with each one individually, but we have to talk with the community. Because also I think it's very important that because we also have to change the values, the habits, that people understand what the needs of the other side. So it's not only, not only me against the government, against the you know, decision maker, but it's also us against the, the government decision maker. So how, how do you believe we can achieve that with uh, these technologies that you're promoting and are so successful with in Estonia? Thank you. I, I fully agree with you. And uh, I also, I like to spend less time on my, on my phone and on my computer, uh, which I recommend everybody to set limits. Uh, there is, uh, at least on iPhone, there is a way to put yourself a limit on different kind of platforms that it doesn't allow you to use that anymore. <laughs> But, um, but anyway, um, I, I, would, I would definitely still say that um, this kind of service and things are, are working the best in a way so that it takes from, from people very little time. And when we use our state portal, uh, which is the most commonly used platform where you can, it's like one-stop shop that you can that do everything, then there is also every time that you log out from there, they, they ask you like couple of questions from there. So to use this kind of platforms where people are already there, then you also have a chance to ask them something that really, really matters for them. Um, and, and of course, also by technology, if we go a little deeper uh, into technical side there, there is a ways to track people's movement on different platforms. Not that I would say that I know that you exactly did this kind of thing, but just like to gather all that to information together and understand about what we would do, what they're struggling with, and so on and so on. So by, by this information, you can already make a lot of decisions and, and based again on their needs and everything. And the other option to become a little closer to uh, decision makers from the citizens' perspective there, uh, we also, every time we have gov like the government meetings or the parliament meetings, we... Um, we kind of video stream them uh, so that people can also see what our decision makers are discussing, uh, which again opens it up for 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 people and and for the local governments. We also have re regulations that it can even show up if if you want to. So 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 definitely, but using technology 
you can gather information much quicker together than doing this kind of service that go out for on paper to someone's mailbox or something and then you have to write whatever you want to or together a very huge like meeting together what like it, it it just takes too much time from from people that are anyway busy um so so yeah i just like if you can put these kind of questions um at the end when when somebody is finishing uh interacting with the state in some way then i i think this works the best um so yeah technology just helps us to um come up with solutions much quicker uh than than doing these things in paper i would say Thank you. Um, uh huh. There's another question. Yeah, please. This feels a little bit like school coming up to to talk. Um, I think it's very nice that we have two sectors here. So I would like to use the opportunity to to talk with the sectors instead of what we usually do is talking about the sectors. Um, talking about um, the, the Elbe Labe region. I was wondering whether you have since 2007, when the integrated ticket system was uh, introduced, whether we have witnessed sort of a, a stronger integration of the area, whether this can be measured in, in a certain way, um, whether this cross-border area has come closer together, um, especially the citizens. Um, and, and concerning the, the digitalization, I wanted to ask it, it obviously in terms of territorial implications might counteract um, rural depopulation. So as you said, you, uh, it makes it easier to, to, to live in the countryside and, and to be fully involved. But I was wondering what the opposite effect maybe on cities is, whether this is not contributing to shrinking cities, to um, problems for the government to actually provide services that cannot be delivered digitally, whether it's not also contributing to maybe a, a decline in, in social cohesion. So whether it does not have sort of also a, a more negative side um, as well as a positive side. Thank you. So thanks for your question. Um, yes, there are indeed measures that show that there's increase of um, cross-border um, connections. It's our ticket sales. So um, you could observe a steady increase of the ticket sales up till um, until 2018 when we changed the ticket assortment and i didn't want to bring these figures because that would lead to um, a misinterpretation of the uh, um, of the figures um, because then people migrated to different new um, tickets we introduced and that would um, yeah showed in a, in, a, in a wrong light so that's why i just brought the uh, the figures from the uh, from the three recent years. So that is the, the quantitative measure we have as public transport sector. I don't know if there are other measures um, from um, yeah, other organizations, um, but I can so far say so far from my own observation is that uh, there are a lot of um, Czech people traveling to Dresden um, uh, for retailing and for, as I said, for the Christmas fair. Uh, so you can hear and uh, you can hear a lot of Czech uh, talks in, in, in Dresden uh, when you're in the inner city. And this ha hasn't been like this uh, before the Czech Republic joined the EU. So, yeah, I don't have a quantitative measure, but uh, you can really observe it. Um. I was just have to, maybe you can repeat that for a second, the, the second half of that. Um, the, in, in terms of the territorial implications of mm -hmm. the policies um, that you have presented, it certainly has a positive impact on sort of stopping rural depopulation, mm -hmm. but what is maybe the impact on cities where mm -hmm. um, we are at the moment struggling with local retail to bring it back into the city? Is, is digitalization not contributing in a negative way uh, to, that, to that trend, for instance? Well, um, partly it, it could, but also I have seen another trend happening now uh, recently also. Um, there, there were a lot of families who in one point again moved like around 20, 30 kilometers outside of the city. Uh, and, and, and again, the cities were just running out of people a little bit in a way in a capital side. Uh, but now it, the trend is that a lot of them have game pack. And, and what I mean is like, they, they sold their houses that were like 20 kilometers away and they, um, they moved to the city center and also they had sold the cars. 
And right now, uh, I don't know how popular it is here, but in a capital city, most of my friends have sold their cars already and said, um, because there is this kind of sharing uh, car system so that uh, there is an application on the phone that you can rent at any time. And there is a lot of them in a city so that you can just find the nearest one, the same as uh, the scooters. I guess that works here too. Um, and this, like the scooters and the cars, and then you just walk by there and, and then you, you can go uh, with your family. I don't know, a week and get away somewhere and just rent that for a couple of days. So it also has really attracted people to, to move back to the city a little bit because there are so many ways to still like, um, like again, uh, be very sustainable uh, because also when they moved like 20 kilometers away, that meant that they had to come every single morning with like driving 20 kilometers with a car, which was also pretty expensive. Uh, but but now they can spend this money uh, on on actually affording a better apartment in a city center. So there are many many trends. Uh, of course, one thing that ca can cause an impact for another. Uh, but but if there is many layers of that, then I don't I don't see a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, we will probably need some data in the end about this. What is actually happening? Uh, I think we have maybe opportunity to have one more question and then we conclude or we also can conclude right now uh, okay yeah i think it's the it's a good time to complete conclude uh, thank you very much again for to all the guests for for joining us for this round table thank you also to mr teplansky for for joining us via zoom uh, and i hope you uh, um, enjoyed the the talk and i bring uh, give word now to ada to, to say more about the afternoon. Thank you, Marco. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for everyone for your presentations and you, dear viewers, for your attention. We have concluded the official parts. I am inviting you for lunch in uh, Izum restaurant. Before going for lunch, a few information uh, about the later part we meet at 2 15 pm we will have our site visit we will see a few initiatives from the field of circular economy okay <laughs> Uh, lunch is on the program now <laughs> at the Izum restaurant and after that uh, you are welcome to uh, join us uh, at the city walk, city tour. Uh -huh. Uh -huh, yeah, we, uh, at, we start at uh, quarter past two. Uh, yeah, in odhodu proti restauraciji pa vabljeni da se tudi zamete tiskana gradiva. Please take uh, the paper materials when leaving for lunch. Thank you very much.